Members of the Senate and guests will please rise as we receive our distinguished president. The Senate will please come to order. Members and guests will con continue to remain standing as we're led in our devotion by our chaplain, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Chaplain. As the book of Job instructs us, let us choose what is right. Let us determine among ourselves what is good. From Job chapter 34, verse four. Join me as we pray. Holy and gracious God, we call upon you this day to bestow a genuinely special blessing upon each leader here in this Senate. Allow these servants, each one of them, to trust you wholly while you guide them in their work. And as they indeed labor for the good of the people of South Carolina, may they determine the very best and the most meaningful means and ways to resolve the issues that are before us during this legislative session. Moreover, Lord, we further ask that you will likewise guide and lead all of our other leaders as well, those women and men who serve in elected and appointed roles of government all across this land. We humbly ask all of this in your wondrous name, dear Lord. Amen. I pledge allegiance. Senator from Lexington, what purpose do you rise? Point of a quorum has been questioned. The clerk will count. Twenty six members are present. A quorum is present. Senator from Cherokee, what purpose do you rise? Unanimous consent request. State your request. I ask unanimous consent to recall House Bill 4815 from the Finance Committee and have it placed on the calendar. Unanimous consent request to re recall from Finance Committee. Any objection? Hearing none, so ordered and replaced on the calendar. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator. Senator from Lexington, Senator Sessler, what purpose yeah, do you raise? Unanimous consent request. State your request. That on the next available day, the Senate adjourn in memory of Jerry Wood, the father of Luke Kennedy. Without objection. Mr. President. Sen Senator from Lexington, you have a further request? With the uh, consent of the chairman of the Senate Education Committee, I move to recall S954. And when it's recalled, I'm going to ask to have it adopted, and I want to be heard, please. Carolina Day. It, is there objection to recalling S-954 from the Education Committee and giving it immediate consideration? Hearing none, so ordered. Mr. President. The Senate, Senator is recognized on the resolution. I, well, I move we adopt the resolution, then I'm going to ask it be read, if I can do that. Pending question is adoption of the resolution. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Ayes have it. It's so ordered. Mr. President. Senator from Lexington. Purpose for speaking on the resolution. Mr. President, if I could uh, ask all Senator from Darlington here, Senator from Richland, Senator from Orangeburg, Senator from Newberry, anybody who is a graduate or a member of the Gamecock Caucus, if you would come up here and join me while we're here, please.
You know, I think it, nearly, Mr. Chairman, I think nearly half of this body are graduates of the University of South Carolina. Just, just want to let you know that. Do what? Got a mayonnaise bowl. I like it. I like it. Mayo, good. mayo, mayo, mayo bowl. That's right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, today is Carolina Day. Uh, before I ask the clerk to read the resolution, I would say to you that the University of South Carolina, which serves 50,000 students and touches every aspect of the state of South Carolina in every corner, and has about a $6 billion impact on the economy of South Carolina. It is the premier flagship institution of this state and a world-class institution of higher learning. We thank them for what they've done. They have alumni, student athletes throughout this state, and they have connections throughout this state. Mr. Clerk, if you would, I would ask unanimous consent to have the clerk read the resolution. Without objection, the reading clerk will read. It's a Senate resolution to recognize and honor the University of South Carolina system for its many and significant contributions to the education and culture of our citizens and to declare January 26, 2022 as Carolina Day at the State House. Whereas the members of the South Carolina Senate appreciate the outstanding opportunities that the University of South Carolina and the entire U of SC system affords to the Palmetto State, to our citizens. Whereas with 60 nationally ranked academic programs, South Carolina was named the state's top global university, ranks in the top 1% of patent producing universities in the world, and boasts the number one international business program and the best public honors college in the United States. Whereas on eight campuses and 20 locations across the state, university's accessibility education enables more than 34,000 South Carolinians to receive a world-class education. Whereas the U of SC system confers nearly 12,000 degrees a year, accounting for 40% of all bachelor's and graduate degrees awarded within the state. Whereas innovative programs such as Gamecock Guarantee, Opportunity Scholars, Gamecock Gateway, Raise Me, and Palmetto Pathway have put U of SC on the forefront of creating programs that help low-income and first-generation students succeed, whereas the comprehensive universities of Aiken, Upstate, and Beaufort are consistently ranked as top public regional colleges in America, and the award-winning Palmetto College campus of Lancaster, Salkahatchee, Sumter, and Union serve a combined 5,000 students each year. Well, South Carolina is in the top 3% of universities in graduating African-American students in the nation, provides more opportunities for African-American and minority students than any other institution in the state by leading in both enrollment and graduation, preparing all its graduates to lead an increasingly diverse and global workforce. Since the fall of 2016, African-American freshman enrollment on the Columbia campus has increased by more than 85%. Whereas nationally recognized by the U.S. News and World Report, Kiplingers and Forbes as a great value, South Carolina is listed amid the most efficient universities in the nation and offers one of the most cost-effective paths to a bachelor's degree in the state. Whereas pumping $6.2 billion in the state's economy annually, economic activities of the university system supports more than 63,000 jobs statewide and each dollar invested in higher education returns 25 to the state. Whereas recognized as a top tier university for research and community engagement, U of SC grows the state's economy through innovative partnerships with companies like Boeing, IBM, Siemens, Apple, Nephron, Yoskawa, and Samsung. And the university faculty members have garnered more than $225 million in sponsored awards last year. And the Office of Economic Engagement is leveraging these innovative partnerships so U of SC students can solve real industry problems today and become technology workers of the future. Whereas in Division I Athletics, South Carolina has won the Palmetto State's Learfield IMG College Directors Cup. 
measuring total athletic success for all sports teams in 19 of the last 22 years. And its student athletes excel in the classroom as well as on the field. South Carolina just completed 29 straight semesters with student athletes whose GPAs averaged 3.0 or higher and since 2015 has had more Southeastern Conference academic honor roll recipients than any other SEC school. Whereas South Carolina athletics program generates more than $300 million in economic activity annually for the state and local economies. Whereas with historic roots dating back over 175 years, University of South Carolina Alumni Association continues ardently serving the university community, connecting students and alumni to advance their careers, their passions, and their university, operating the Pastides Alumni Center as a place to gather and celebrate important moments in the life of our alumni and the greater Midlands community. Whereas the members of the Senate of the state of South Carolina value the commitment of the state's flagship university an entire U of SC system to continued academic, educational, and athletic excellence, affordability, and availability to the citizens of our great state. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate, members of the South Carolina Senate, by this resolution, recognize and honor University of South Carolina and the entire U of SC system for its many and significant contributions to the education and culture of our citizens, and to declare January 26, 22, as Carolina Day at the State House. Ladies and gentlemen of the Senate, you've heard Senate. the academic accomplishments of the University of South Carolina and its contributions, but we can't go without also saying thank you to Dr. Pastides and his wife Patricia for serving as the interim president of the University of South Carolina in a time of need. We thank them for their service, to not only to the university, but also to the state of South Carolina. Secondly, we can't let it go without being said that the University of South Carolina is the home to the number one women's college basketball team in America, national champions, and also home to a young and bold new football coach who will bring history to this state. Any other member want to say something? Senator Darlington, <laughs> let's give the university a round of applause and thank them for what their contributions are. Appreciate U of SC Day. We appreciate it. Please stand. They're out in the out in the lobby. We stand. You are right invited now. tonight to a reception from five to seven at the Pastides Center Alumni Center. Please join them. The resolution was unanimously adopted. Thank you, Senator from Lexington. Are there any petitions, memorials, presentments of grand jury, or such like papers? President, we have no communications on that. Okay. We have no further have any communications. Therefore, we are on the introduction of new bills and resolutions. The clerk will read. Introduction of a bill by Senator Adams. It's relating to domestic relations to enact the Multifamily Dwelling Safety Act, adds a chapter of the code, to provide necessary definitions to require Department of Labor Licensing Regulations to adopt a multifamily dwelling balcony code establishing minimum standards for balcony railings that are primarily conducted of wood and are located in multifamily dwellings. Labor, commerce, and industry. Bill by Senator Massey, it amends a code related to general exemptions from taxes to add an appropriately numbered new item to provide an exception for private passenger motor vehicles owned or are leased by a member of the armed forces of the United States stationed outside this state when the service member's home of record is in South Carolina and the vehicle is registered in South Carolina. Finance Committee. Bill by Senator Fanning, it amends the code adds a chapter to provide that county council elections may be conducted on a partisan or nonpartisan basis to provide that partisan elections for county council are the default, provide for two methods by which nonpartisan county council elections may be imposed. Judiciary Committee. Introduction of a bill by Senator Hibri, it, it's to enact the Charter School Accountability Act. It amends the code related to the intent of the General Assembly in the Charter School Act so as to include provisions concerning governance and accountability. Education Committee. 
Introduction of a bill by Senators Campson and Grooms that amends an act relating to the composition of residency in terms of the school trustees of certain districts in Charleston County. Placed on the local calendar. Senate Education Committee has reported favorable with amendments. On S3590, it's a bill amending the code by adding a section to provide public school districts may hire non-certified teachers for any school and career and technology centers that have vacant teaching positions five business days before the beginning of the school year. Placed on the calendar. Placed on the calendar. Education Committee has reported favorable on a statewide appointment member of the Commission on Higher Education at large, Mr. Doug Snyder. Received his information. Yes, it's clear, Mr. President. The clerk informs me that the desk is clear. Are there any requests for local bills? Any request for local bills? Senator from Charleston, Senator. Parliament, parliamentary inquiry. Did the uh, state state your inquiry? Was the resolution read? Did you? The resolution was read. I'm inquiring as to whether the resolution for Abe Jenkins has been read. I'm informed that it has been. I'd like to be heard briefly on the resolution. You're recognized for up to three minutes on the resolution. Senator from Charleston, Thank Senator Kimson. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, I'll be brief. On last week, I rose to request that this body, uh, at the earliest time available, agree to the unanimous consent resolution or a motion that we adjourn in honor of Abe Jenkins. There's a poem. There's a poem that's been written called Live Your Creed. I won't read all of it to you. Just the first stanza that I think epitomizes Abe's life. I'd rather see a sermon than to hear one any day. I'd rather one walk with me than to merely show me a way. The I is a better pupil and more willing than the ear. Advice may be misleading, but examples are always clear. And the very, very, very best teachers are the ones who live their creed. Abe Jenkins resided in Charleston, South Carolina, worked for the Medical University, South Carolina, freedom fighter for human rights, civil rights, died on January 17th. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to acknowledge his faithful and loyal and dedicated courage to fighting for voting rights, for working in the trenches, for the downtrodden, for being the voice for those who can't speak for themselves. In closing, there's a hymn that we sing in church. And don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. But may the work I've done speak for me. The work that Abe Jenkins did for the citizens of Charleston County and the stout state of South Carolina speaks volumes and I'm I will be deeply honored this this Saturday to rate, make remarks at his funeral which will be held in Charleston and I will acknowledge that all of my colleagues exp express their profound sorrow at the passing of this great South Carolinian. Thank you Mr. President. Thank you. By previous order, the resolution had been adopted. Senator from Spartanburg, Senator Martin, what purpose do you rise? State your request. Of the Senator from Charleston be placed in the journal. 
without objection. So ordered. Any other local bills? Any other local bills? Hearing none, that takes us to the mass head status of S-966 on page one. The Senator from Ori. Move to carry that over. Senator Rankin moves to carry over. All in favor say aye. Any opposed, ayes have it. So ordered. That takes us to page six, statewide, uncontested calendar. Page six, the first one is 3255. 3255, the clerk will read. It's a bill relating to exceptions from licensure requirements for real estate appraisers so as to modify exemptions for licensees of the Real Estate Commission. Third reading of the bill, all in favor say aye. Any opposed? Ayes have it. The bill is given third reading. Yeah. Senator from Sumter is recognized for introduction. The doctor of the day. Senator is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the body. Um, I've got one of my homeboys from Sumter here today in that white coat, uh, Dr. Mays DeBose, who has been a friend of mine for many, many years. Him and his uh, wife, Randy Carroll, and his two boys, Edmonds and Lucas, live not too far from us. And Mays has been is from Sumter, grew up there just like I did. And what he's got written down on here was, is I am not a gerontologist. He is a geriatrician. I made the mistake a couple of years ago of calling him a gerontologist, and he very diplomatically told me, I am a gerontologist technically, but if you want to be more specific about it, I'm a geriatrician. So his, his specialty is geriatrics. There's a lot of you in this chamber he could probably help, okay? Um, <laughs> but uh, but I, it is interesting, um, Mr. Chairman from Gaffney, he, uh, that he picked uh, Carolina Day to come up here and, and do his service at the State House because he is a big Clemson fan. Um, nobody's perfect, but, um, but I, but I am glad that he picked that he picked today. So Mays, Dr. DeBose, thank you for taking time away from your practice. Thank you for taking time away from your family again this year to come up here and take care of us. Um, welcome to the Senate, and thanks again. Thank, thank you for your service. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sumter. Okay, members of the Senate, that takes us to page 16 in the calendar. Bottom of the page, S2. Four eight by the senator from Aiken and others. The reading clerk will read. Committee amendment is on the desk. Se senator from Spartanburg, what purpose do you rise? Mr. President, um, I rise to make a point of order. State your point. Under Rule 39, this bill has not been on the calendar the required amount of time. Which sustain your point. That takes us to S908. On page 17, top of the page, the reading clerk, reading clerk will read. The Senator from Spartanburg, what purpose do you ask? I'll just be brief and renew my same point of order on the last bill. On S908, you're raising the same point. The point is sustained. That takes us to S947, the middle of page 17, by the Senator from Berkeley and others. The reading clerk will read. Mr. President. Senator from Spartanburg, Senator Martin, what purpose do you rise? I renew my same point of order. Same point of order on S947. That point is sustained. The reading clerk will read. We're on the bottom of page 17, H3211. Mr. President. Senator from Spartanburg, Senator Martin, what purpose do you rise? I renew my same point of order. That point is also sustained. Thank you. Thank you. That takes us to the top of page 18, concurrent resolutions, H4746. Amendment on the desk, Mr. President. Got the reading clerk will read, got a, a amendment on the desk. Senator from Spartanburg. Wish to be okay. heard on the amendment. Okay, let me publish the amendment and be recognized. Amendment by Senator Martin, number one, has been previously proposed at amendment to concurrent resolution. Page four strikes lines nine, four through nine. Senator from Spartanburg, Senator Martin is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'd like to make a unanimous consent request with me holding the floor. State your request. To 
withdraw that amendment and go to Amendment 1A. Is there objection to the unanimous consent request? Hearing none, so ordered. We'll, we'll let the clerk read the amendment. I have the reading clerk publish the amendment. Amendment number 1A is by Senator Martin. It amends a resolution on page 4. It strikes lines 4 through 9 and inserts that in the absence of joint rules, the General Assembly, by this resolution, agrees to bind itself subject to the terms of this resolution and to the requirements of Article 3 of Section 20 of Section 22 of the South Carolina Constitution and provisions of Chapter 19 of Title II of the Code relating to elections of members of the judiciary, provided that the vote to elect any judge under the provisions of this resolution, whether the election is contested or not, must be a recorded roll call vote. For purposes of this subsection, recorded roll call vote means a vote recorded in the journals of the respective houses of the General Assembly, which must be by the ayes and nays and recorded by name. The House of Representatives may use the electronic roll call system as provided by Rule 7, House Rule 7, without unanimous consent. Thank you, sir. Um, the, Senator the main, Spartanburg. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. President. The main difference in the amendment that I withdrew in this one is the last sentence where it says the House of Representatives may use the electronic roll call system as provided by House Rule 7 without unanimous consent. I think a lot of times when we're over there and somebody calls for a roll call or doesn't allow them to vote on the board, that takes a lot of time. So I wanted to change that so that when we do these roll calls and people know where we vote, then the House can do it by the, on their board. The other thing is, as I spoke before the bill was contested the last time, I was trying to reiterate my points that if someone is unopposed, there's really no method for us in the Joint Assembly to vote yes or no. You know, a lot of times candidates drop out. A lot of times there may be three or four candidates screened out by the Judicial Merit Selection Committee. But then there may be something worked out or people realize they may not have certain commitments and they drop out and we're left with one candidate to, to cast a vote on. And really what I want to do is just make sure we have a method rather than myself or others having to go and tell the desk that, hey, I'd like to be recorded. Because our constituents back home, when they, when they want to know how we voted on Judge A, and we say, well, I, I didn't really vote, but I put a statement in the journal. They don't want to really hear that at Hardy's when you talk to them. They, they don't want to hear that. They want to look and see that, hey, everybody in the House and everybody in the Senate, they love this judge. There was no problems. Or they want to see that, hey, this judge got elected 80 to 60. Maybe there's some issues there. I don't know. But what I want is, I know it's probably going to take a little bit of time, but I don't, and I really, at the end of the day, this is the only place I could find to do this right now. At the end of the day, I would like to take a look, um, Mr. Chairman of Rules, I'd like to take a look at maybe the, the Joint Assembly Rules at some point to where we can address some of this and make it easier. But for this election, I would just like to, to have this done this way, and that, that's why I propose the amendment. And I, at this time, I will yield, gladly yield for questions. Senator from Orangeburg, Senator Hutto, what purpose do you rise? Just ask him a question. Regarding yes, sir. Senator yields for questions. I do yield. Time is the issue. As you identified in the second part of letting them vote on the board, what if we just changed it and said it and you put in a statement in the journal if the presiding officer said any member wishing to vote no, will be recorded as voting no. And then you can put it, your name on the desk and it'll show you voting no. Because what's gonna happen, or what, next, whenever we go on February 4th, none of them are contested. I don't think any of them are contested. I mean, if, if, we, if I know I've got to go stand over there for two hours and every 15 minutes say I, you know, I got better things to do. If, and I don't, but I don't want you not to be recorded no, but why would you make me sit through two hours of voting yes when it'd be so simple for you to walk up to the desk and vote no? Senator, I don't have a problem with that. What I would like, and I don't even know if it needs to be in here, if it needs to be a gentleman's agreement, or a, and ladies, I don't mean that as anything. What I mean by that is anybody, agreement of the body of our colleagues. I would like to be able to have someone to be allowed to be recognized if they need to be heard on election. And I would like to be recorded as voting no as an official vote of no. And I don't, uh, I think you should be allowed to vote no. And if, if changing it, but, but so as we don't have to go through all 46, I would just ask that you consider redrafting this into 1B 
to say that we'll authorize you or any person to vote no and it'd be recorded in the journal as a no vote by going to the desk rather than having to go through all 46 names being called. Um, Cause if we've got to do that, I, I didn't look, but it seems like there are like 20 something judges for next time. We, we will be there for two hours when in reality, we might be there as short as 15 minutes. Would you go into the desk with all of your no votes that you want? And, and, and I think what you're saying really gets at it. It's not a statement in the journal, like they were elected right. by the body and then all of a sudden I put in a statement because my constituents won't know if I'm there or not. And it, and it suits me if, if you, you, you know, that they want to tally how many people are there and just put the total, what the total was, but however you want to do it, I, don't, I think you should be allowed to vote no. But I also don't think that we should waste a lot of, I mean, we got precious little time to get Senator, through a lot of I, I things. Agree, I agree with you. And what I'd like to do is I would like to move this today, but I don't want to hold up what we're doing. Is there any way that we could come back to this today at some point after you and I work together on an amendment sure. and then take it up? I'll be, gl I'll be glad to. All right, well, Mr. President, I'd, I'd like to ask with me holding the floor on this resolution right now, an amendment that we carry this over and by unanimous consent come back to it at the end of the day and take it up before we adjourn no matter what before before you do that would you withhold that unanimous consent for a question yes sir senator from Ori, senator rankin what purpose do you rise see if my friend from the north will yield for a friendly question yes sir i will yield. senator yield and and i want to understand Again, today, I think I understood the other day, although I had it flipped, because I, I understood your effort to apply only to contested races, which, of course, there will be votes. But the, the import of your, or the, the effect of your amendment would be to require the number of Senate members who are physically present, or, or better yet, the, the reading clerk to call 46 names to vote yes or no on an unopposed race. This Amendment 1A would, but the Amendment 1B that I will work on with the Senator from Orangeburg will not. All right, and so I, my goal is to, again, the brilliant minds that you two have, if, if the intent is to uh, effectively, proactively, or affirmatively create for you the trigger which I think we all understand now exist, you physically can go put your name. I did not vote for Judge Joe Smith. What you want to do is trigger that in, again, what are you thinking that right, you right now, what would or happen, how that would be different? Senator from Maury, what, what happens now is the, the vote would happen by acclamation. They would be voted in by a voice vote. It would be assumed that every member voted no. My only recourse would be to put a statement in the journal. So when a constituent goes and looks on the roll call votes of Shane Martin, they're not going to find that vote. They're going to have to go look for a journal statement and see where I voted against a certain judge. This way, it would be a vote. It, it may be 169 to 1, or it could be, you know, 150 to 20. But there would be a recorded vote. But anybody that didn't go say they were voting no, they're going to be recorded as voting yes, as long as they were present at the general president of the joint assembly okay and i understand that effect of 1a what are you thinking you would do differently in 1b well no 1a is what we're on now 1a right. would, would require the house to vote on the board and the senate to be right. asked 46 times but again is the hopeful result of what you're looking to do to create again an affirmative right that you get to go do that, and we've defined it, and look, guys, yes, here's where we That's have right, the because right, right now there's no place other than a journal statement. There's no place for a true no vote on an uncontested race. And so, again, just walk me through what you intend this to look like with this rule or this amendment to the amendment. What, what are you thinking you're... Well, just, just what the senator from Orangeburg and I talked about. It would just allow anybody that wanted to vote no, officially no, they could notify the desk on those uncontested races they wanted to vote no on. But isn't that, again, the same right you have now? No, you don't because you just get a statement in the journal. So when they click on roll, vote, roll call vote 457 for the year, there isn't one. It would just be a statement. 
my constituents couldn't look on the roll call votes under my name and see how I voted. It wouldn't be there. They'd have to go to the Senate Journal and figure out what day it was. Oh, there's a statement by the Senator from Spartanburg. Yeah, so he said that, but why didn't you vote, Senator? But why you'll you go, vote? so again, forgive me for belaboring this, you'll go and hand something else in that is a no vote for these particular judges. Correct. And if, and if I don't hand them a no vote for other judges, then I'll be listed as yes. Or if no, and I guess if nobody said no, there might not even be anything by the desk on that. Senator from Orangeburg, Senator Hote, what purpose do you rise? See if you yield for one more statement, and I'll be glad to work with you on this, but did you know what I envisioned is it would say that Judge John Doe was elected by acclamation with Senator Martin voting no, so that it would, that way we wouldn't have to call all the names. Um, I think that's all, all we're trying to get as is, a, is something this time efficient as right now it says he's voted by acclamation and then you have a statement in the journal what you want is the statement to actually say that you voted no right i want to be recording any other senators it's only a statement so i well, i'll yield unanimous consent to state your state your unanimous consent i just unanimous consent requests that when we do the uh, senate journal following the next judicial elections that we adopt the process by which the journal will actually record no votes. I mean, if this needs to be a rule change, that's fine. But if it's something as ministerial as the desk being able to just change it to show that people who come and vote no will be recorded as voting no, maybe we don't need to do this. And so I would ask the, uh, the presiding officer to see if that's possible. Well, you, 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 you made that in the form of unanimous, unanimous consent, consent request that we do that. On the floor. If, if, with, with him holding the floor, unanimous consent request that we uh, request that the, that the desk just change the method of how they write down the recorded votes in an acclamation vote so that anybody who does vote no is not just in a statement, but it says in the journal that they voted no. Right. I, I, Excuse me, Senator from Orangeburg. I want to temporarily object. I'd really rather work with you and get some language that we can all live with, okay. if that's okay. So I'd like, if there's no more questions, I'd like to renew my unanimous consent motion that we carry this over, leaving it open for amendments, and before we adjourn today, that we come back to this resolution. I've heard a unanimous consent request to carry it over and come back to it before the end of the day. Any objection to the unanimous consent? Hear it none. So ordered. Thank you, Thank Senator you. from Spartanburg. We're still on page 18. We're at the bottom of the page, S-917, by the Senator from Georgetown. Reading clerk will read. Concurrent resolution requesting the Department of Transportation named the U.S. 701 bridge over the Great P.D. River, the Charles A. Henson Memorial Bridge, wrecked appropriate signs and markers. Pending questions, adoption of the resolution. All in favor, please say aye. Any opposed, ayes have it. So ordered. That takes us to the top of page 19. Pa top of page 19, S1001. Uh, the senator from Richland and others, the reading clerk will read. Current resolution, it requests the Department of Transportation name the portion of South Carolina Highway 215 in Richland County, the George E. Glimpf Memorial Highway, and direct appropriate signs and markers. The pending question is the adoption of resolution S1001. All in favor, please say aye. Any opposed, no. The ayes have it and so ordered. That takes us to the bottom of page 19, S. 1002. Amendment on the desk. By the Senator from Orangeburg. The reading clerk will read, and there's an amendment on the desk. The, the amendment is by Senator Grooms, amends a resolution, page one, strikes line 22, and inserts, whereas while Jack departed his early life in 2002, and Emma Lee. Senator from Orangeburg, Senator Stevens, what purpose do you rise? Mr. President, to explain the amendment. You recognize to explain the amendment. Uh, Senate colleagues, in the original uh, resolution, it was uh, recorded that Jack uh, departed his earth earthly life in 2007. Uh, the, the amendment now reads that Jack departed his earth earthly life 
in 2002. So that is the change from 2007 to 2002. Okay. So the pending question is the adoption of the amendment. Yes. All in favor would say aye. Any opposed, ayes have it so ordered. There are no further amendments, so the pending question now is the adoption of S-1002 as amended. All in favor, please say aye. Any opposed? Ayes have it. So ordered S-1002 as amended, as adopted. That completes the call of the uncontested calendar. We are now in the motion period. Senator from Edgefield, what purpose do you rise? Mr. President, I move to dispense with the balance of the motion period. All in favor of would say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Ayes have it so ordered. Senator from Claren, what purpose do you have? Thank you, Mr. President. I have a local road naming bill that I've discussed with the chairman of the Transportation Committee. He is not here today, but with his permission, um, I'd like to ask that bill be be called from the committee and placed on the calendar. And as I said, the chairman is, is in agreement with that. Do you, have bill the bill, 1, do you have the bill number? 1,000. 1,000. So is there objection to recall an S-1,000 from the Transportation Committee and place it on the calendar? Hear none? So ordered. Thank you. Senator, Senator from Orangeburg, Senator Stevens, what purpose do you rise? Uh, unanimous consent. State, state, your, state your unanimous consent. As unanimous consent with approval from the chairman of the Transportation Committee that uh, S-1012, a road naming bill, be recalled from the Transportation Committee and placed on the calendar. Unanimous consent request to have S-1012, 1012, recalled from the Transportation Committee and placed on the calendar. Any objection? Senator from Smartenburg. Just quick, quick question. Um, Senator Yule, for a question. Senator from Orangeburg, would you yield briefly? Yes. Senator Yule. Yes. Sen did, did you state you had talked with the chairman and the staff's already looked over everything? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. I just want to make sure because a lot of times I don't want it to have to come back and go back to committee. So I just want to check. Thank you, sir. Thank you. No objection, Mr. President. Okay. Without objection, S-1012 is recalled from the Transportation Committee and placed on the calendar. Senator from Edgefield, what purpose do you rise? Mr. President, um, I move that we invite the House to ratify acts at a mutually convenient time. All in favor say aye. Opposed no, ayes have it, so ordered. Mr. President. Yes, sir, Senator from Edgefield. Mr. President, could I be recognized for an introduction? You, Senator from Edgefield is recognized for the purpose of introduction. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the Senate, we have with us outside the chamber today um, is the pilot cohort of LEAD SC. Uh, the purpose of LEAD SC is to provide emerging leaders in state government with the knowledge and skills to be successful while fostering a desire to create a career within state government. Uh, these participants are here from several state agencies, PRT, Department of Administration, DJJ, Department of Revenue, DSS, others. Um, they're going to gain a better understanding of the functions of state government and how they can help their agency and this state flourish. Uh, the Senator from Lexington, Senator Sheely, has been very engaged uh, with these um, group of emerging leaders and hopefully we'll have a chance to interact with some of them at some point later today. So if you see some of these folks, please welcome them to the State House. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator from Edgefield. Appreciate, appreciate the introduction. We're now on special order S-150 by the Senator from Buford and others. The reading clerk will read committee amendment. Affairs Committee proposes the following amendment. Mr. Bill. Senator from Buford, what purpose do you rise? Speak on the committee amendment. To explain to yes. explain the the committee amendment on the bill. Senator from Buford.
Senator from Buford. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Yes, um, Member of the Senate, I, I'm rise at this point in time to speak on the uh, committee amendment. Um, and, and after I explain it, I'm going to ask that it be adopted as the working document. I know there are many individuals that want to draw amendments to this bill. Um, I think that will enable the bill to appear on the screen. But I wanted to touch base on just the changes that were made in the committee amendment to the underlying bill. First of all, there was a section of the bill that talked about where revenues um, through, through fees or the sales tax um, are meant to administer the program. Um, it's not meant to go to the general fund. Um, then the question arose, well, what do we do then with if there's excess monies? And so there was an amendment that said that if there are revenues generated in excess of the amount needed to administer the program, 3% would go for research conducted by University of South Carolina School of Medicine, MUSC. 2% would go to um, local providers uh, for purposes relating to alcohol and drug abuse prevention and education. 3% would go to SLED. 2% to the South Carolina Department of Education for drug safety education. And then 85% to the general fund. And 5% for research conducted by, um, I've already mentioned that, excuse me, the medical research institutions. The, the second thing that, the second part of the committee amendment is that nothing in this bill may be construed to require a health insurance provider, health care plan, property or casualty insurer, or medical assistance program to be liable for or reimburse a claim for medical use of cannabis. That was requested by um, the insurance uh, lobby. Um, and then lastly, or second to last, it requires that um, the dispensaries that would dispense the medical cannabis, that they be obliged to employ um, at least one pharmacist, physician assistant, or clinical practice nurse who is licensed by the state and who has completed a medical cannabis continuing education course approved by the South Carolina Board of Medical Examiners. Um, and then lastly, uh, there were some concerns, and I'll address them in my comments on the underlying bill, about whether or not there's federal preemption um, because of the Controlled Substances Act. And so the final amendment in the committee amendment states that this particular law becomes void and of no force and effect um, upon the filing of an order by, um, I'm sorry, um, if it's repealed by operation of law, if, if a federal court pursuant to a filing by the United States of America or one of its authorized executive agencies issues a final order declaring that this, this act is preempted by um, the um, CSA. Um, so that's a brief description of the committee amendment. I would make an unanimous consent request with me holding the floor that we adopt this committee amendment for purposes of having a working document so that members could then draw their amendments and so it would appear on the screen. Before you do that, would you uh, withhold that for to be recognized sure. Senator from Charleston, Senator Camps, sure, Senator for Yelson. a question? Thank you. Senator, for, for, the, uh, for the last question. aspect of this amendment that you described, um, that it would become void if the federal government did what again? Yeah, if the, I'm sorry, I read that too quickly. Um, that's short, so I'll just read its entirety. Um, sections 1 through 8, which is the entire bill, shall be repealed by operation of law if a federal court pursuant to a filing by the United States of America or one of its authorized executive agencies issues a final order declaring that those sections have been preempted by the Federal Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act of 1970, more commonly referred to as the Controlled Substances Act. So I'm going to make, make the argument um, shortly that there has not been preemption but there were those that wanted to make clear that in the event the United States claimed it was preemption and in the event the district court ruled that it was, that this law would automatically be void. Okay, so my next question is if it's my understanding that, that marijuana is on a Schedule I drug, I think it's a Schedule I. Schedule one. And so if it moved, I don't know which schedule it needs to move to to where it actually a pharmacist could dispense the drug. Is it a Schedule II? Two? Two. A schedule, okay. schedule one, the, the, the definition of those substances like heroin and marijuana that are placed on Schedule one 
is that they are materially harmful to the public health and they have no medical value. So if you wanted to get it to a point where um, there would be federal authorization to prescribe, you would be talking about rescheduling at the two. Okay, so my question, my, so my question, my, my final question, I think, or the, the, core, the real question I want to get to is, if it, marijuana were moved from a Schedule One to a Schedule Two, would that trigger this provision that would make this bill void? Would, would moving from Schedule One to Two, which means it's treated like other drugs, right, that, far, that doctors prescribe and pharmacists yeah. dispense, would that, would, would that in and of itself trigger? It wouldn't invalidate this act. I mean, you would, you, so I mean, we may want to consider if and when it is rescheduled um, from a one to a two, we may decide that this particular approach is, is no longer the best approach. I mean, we may revisit this, but it would not be automatically. It would not be automatic. No, no sir. That's, that automatic. was my question. What, what, are you open to making that automatic? Because then it'd be treated like any other drug that is that a farm that a doctor prescribes I mean, and a pharmacist yeah, dispense. Yeah, we could be happy to you know draft an amendment. I'm sure we're going to have discussions and put it on the desk and happy to, okay. to look at that. I just wanted to know no, what question. the playing field looks like. Thank you. I understand. You know, renew your unanimous. Uh, yeah, consent. just renew. I, I'll say it again. Unanimous consent with me holding the floor that we adopt the committee amendment as the working document for mem for amendments to be drafted. That is any objection? Hearing none. So ordered. Senator from Buford. It's on the desk, Mr. President. Members of the Senate, let me, let me start um, my remarks by thanking the Majority Leader, um, Shane Massey, Senator from Edgefield, and also the Minority Leader, um, Senator Hutto, from, uh, Senator from Orangeburg, for agreeing to put this bill on special order debate. Um, you know, I've, I've been here, this is my 14th year, it's hard for me to believe, but I know that it's, it's, it's difficult to get matters heard. It's, it's get difficult to get matters heard when there's not overwhelming support by the caucus. And I'm appreciative of the fact that I'm given this opportunity to, to talk about this bill in detail, um, to share with you why I think there's a lot of information that's, that's being put, it, put out there. Um, this information that I'd add is, is e easily refuted, which I will refute. Um, but ultimately, um, it's, it's up to me to convince a majority of this body that this is in the best interest of the people of South Carolina. And I wanted to start by thanking them for, uh, and, and for the body, for setting it for special order debate. Um, I, I first got involved in um, medical cannabis in 2014. Some of you may recall we passed a law that year um, that legalized cannabis oil um, up to 0.9% of THC included in it um, for use by epilepsy patients. And so, um, you know, one of the things that we hear is that there's never been a case where the General Assembly has legislated medicine or that the General Assembly has done something other than simply wait for the FDA to approve something, and, and that's just not the case. We, in 2014, we passed uh, a cannabis oil with THC uh, law that allowed epilepsy patients to benefit from it, and, and they have benefited from it. Um, we've also just recently, um, a couple, three years ago, passed the right to try legislation, which, as you'll recall, um, if you were terminally ill, and that law, uh, authorize physicians to use non-FDA approved medicines um, that had had some clinical trials, as, as cannabis has, but had not been approved by the FDA, um, and we passed that. And I think that has, has succeeded in, in giving some terminally ill patients some alternatives that they didn't currently have. So this, this notion that we've never authorized through legislation the use of medicine is dis disproved in those two instances just during the time that I've been here. Um, after that 2014 legislation that got, what, this passed this body and over in the House, I think for almost unanimously, maybe a few, few votes in, in opposition and signed into law by Governor Haley, um, in the course of researching that, um, that particular 
legislation, I became aware of the other conditions for which cannabis can be medically efficacious. And, and so what I then did is over the last seven years and you know, numerous subcommittee hearings, um, well over 100 witnesses for and against. Um, and this bill has been, been looked at and vetted and amended and, and I'll go through that process later too. But, but one of the things that we decided or I decided early on was that this was gonna be a, a different kind of medical cannabis bill. It, it wasn't gonna be like um, the medical cannabis bills in the 36, 36 other states that have medical cannabis laws. Um, because I wanted it to be a very tightly regulated medical bill that made clear in no uncertain terms that it was meant to provide medicine um, and put in safeguards against it becoming a de facto adult use or recreational use. Because I think, and, and I'll be talking about some of the polling data later, I think that's where the majority of South Carolinians are. I, I think um, the majority of South Carolinians, and not just by a bare majority, you were talking by a 70 to 75 percent, they want to empower doctors to give cannabis to patients if in that doctor's opinion, and after making an in-person diagnosis, determines that cannabis could be of medicinal benefit to the patient. And unlike other states, we have a very tightly defined window of conditions that can qualify. And the reason it's tightly defined, and there's, there's 13 conditions. I mean, unlike, for instance, Mississippi, um, which is about to um, enact their medical cannabis law, has a couple dozen. This one has only 13 because I only wanted to have conditions in this bill listed for which there is solid medical, peer-reviewed medical evidence that cannabis can be a benefit. Okay, so, so when I go through these, and I'm gonna go through each one of these and talk about the studies, the peer-reviewed studies that talk about the efficaciousness of, of cannabis to treat them, here's what we'll be talking about. These, these are the universe of conditions for which doctors can authorize cannabis use by patients. Cancer, multiple sclerosis, a neurological disease, including epilepsy, glaucoma, PTSD, Crohn's disease, sickle cell anemia, ulcerative colitis, wasting syndrome, autism, severe or persistent nausea, a chronic medical condition causing severe and persistent muscle spasms, and any chronic or debilitating disease or medical condition for which an opioid is currently or could be prescribed by a physician. So, so those are the universe of, of conditions that can qualify. Um, in, in regard to PTSD and chronic pain, there was some concerns expressed along the way that to some degree, those conditions are subjective. Uh, to some degree, um, they're not like multiple sclerosis or Crohn's disease or, or that have you know, empirical um, evidence that you're suffering from a condition. And there was a concern that that could be a loophole through which a whole universe of individuals could come in trying to get medical marijuana when they really didn't need it. And so we amended the bill to say that in instances of PTSD, and this pains me to do it, but th there has to be um, a, a written evidence or authoritative evidence that the individual seeking cannabis for PTSD has had an underlying trauma experience in terms of what that experience was. You know, so, okay, we put that in. In regard to chronic pain, we put in there that it needs to be tied to something that is diagnosable by a physician, uh, it, that the pain relates to something that can actually be empirically diagnosed by a physician. So, so again, that was an attempt to work around this argument that somehow people might be faking it, or um, which, which I would just submit economically doesn't make any sense, because why would you commit a fraud and a felony and get a medical cannabis card to get cannabis for twice what you could then go down the street and buy it? So, but, but anyway, we put that in there. Um, 
and, and there's other examples of amendments, um, tightening of language um, that occurred over time. You know, some, you know, requested by Laura Hudson from the victims group, some requested by Chief Keel, some requested by the South Carolina Medical Association, some requested by um, the faith community. And I'm going to go through all those requests and show that in every instance, we listened to their concerns and put them into the bill. Um, you know, some very drastic ones, for instance. I mean, we, you know, unlike most medical cannabis laws and unlike the one Mississippi is about to pass, we, you can't burn leaf. You can't smoke marijuana. There's, there's something about that that law enforcement really objected to, that, um, that if somebody was smoking a joint or burning leaf, um, that they would not be able to distinguish immediately whether or not this person was taking it for medicinal reasons or was smoking it recreationally. So we made it so that it was oils. Um, that could be um, a tincture or taken orally or it could be a, uh, rubbed on your skin or it could be vaped. And we'll talk about the vaping uh, section as well. But I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna get into it in, in, into some detail and, and the Senator from Cherokee said something to me in medical affairs that stuck with me and, and it, it, it reminded me that I really hadn't done my job up until that point and that I was making arguments I think, I think his quote was, my heart tells me you're right, but my head tells me um, be careful. And, and so what I've attempted to do over the last several months is, is make the intellectual argument, make the argument based on logic, make the argument based on the law, make the argument based on what do these empirical studies show. Because we, we've had, you know, in some instances, two decades of experience uh, that states have had with medical cannabis law. So we can look at some of the um, societal ills that, that some worry about, and we can look and see whether or not they're justified. Um, and so I'm going to stick to evidentiary things, uh, for lack of a better phrase. But, but I did want to start, that having been said, and, and before we get down into the, um, to the nuts and bolts of this, um, I was going to say into the weeds, but I wouldn't say that. Um, um, I, I want to, and I think this is important, because I want to show a, a video clip um, of, of testimony by one of my constituents, somebody I think most people in this room knows, Margaret Richardson, who is the wife of Scott Richardson, who used to hold my Senate seat. He became Department of Insurance um, Commissioner back in 2007, I think, and he stepped down and... Um, um, and then that, that gave rise to elections to fill that seat, and ultimately I took that seat in 2009. But, but I, I want to emphasize this because I want you, as we go through this, I want you to remember this. Because this is, this is, to me, is key. Please, show it. I'm Margaret Richardson, and I come here today as a wife, a mother, a sister, a grandmother. And 2014, I was stricken with a condition that Emily's familiar with, evidently, trigeminal neuralgia. And I'm a tomboy, grew up kicking the guys in the shins and running around the yard like a boy. I never thought that I would be relegated in a fetal position, wasting away on prescribed opioids in my bed. I'm still from the onset of the trigeminal neuralgia in spite of two wonderful surgeries at Emory, recovering from the devastation of the prescribed opioids on my stomach. I took them only four months because now my face and head are full of wires. I have a transmitter to try to override the pain from the trigeminal neuralgia. When the pain wins, you land on the floor and scream out like an animal. It's a tough situation to be in. And when the one legal solution, opioids, as you know, can cause so many grim side effects, I read recently that 58,000 South Carolinians this year will die from opioid overdosing. And at this point, when I took what I was allowed to take and prescribed to take, I withered away. I had to stop taking them. My 
rig, as I affectionately call it, worked for three years. A year ago, April, out of nowhere, the screaming, because I woke up. And trigeminal neuralgia is like having a Bunsen burner turned on in the side of your head. It's not something that you can ignore. And since the one legal solution, opioids, almost killed me, because I have to be honest, without my husband to feed me, I was too weak to get out of the bed to even walk to the kitchen to feed myself. And another thing about the opioids, with a lot of people, I can't speak to all of them, is it's not just that it wrecks your stomach or puts you to bed. It takes you out of life. Yes, it blocks the pain. But in addition, I had to quit my job. Um, I, it steals your life. And I wasn't about to take, when it came back, the very thing that almost ended everything for me. So I looked for something new. And because of four years of this condition, people knew I was suffering and some people came forth. I didn't even know what medical cannabis was until last fall. And quite frankly, I can understand why it's overwhelming to you all. Because the stereotypical Woodstock hippie is what a lot of us think of. But that's been replaced by tiny children with 100 epileptic seizures per hour. Or people like me who are suffering. Or whether our precious soldiers have post-traumatic stress disorder. And off of what they have mimics what I have with the blast in their head. And I was told by one of the statisticians at Emory that not only do our veterans get the pain, which is intractable, but also the memory of being blown up or whatever else happens to them. So I just implore you to please give those of us in need a chance. I'm a law-abiding citizen. I cannot tell you what it felt like to come into possession of something that, A, I didn't know if it was going to be damaging. I don't know if it's what's on the label is true because it's not regulated. But my only choice was to scream in pain, so I opted to try it. I have to creep around like a criminal. If I want to go on a trip or get in my car. I have to worry about being pulled over. And just a quick example, and I'm almost finished, but I went to a wedding in Greenville, South Carolina. I didn't want to get my host who were driving me in trouble because my husband was out of town. I went to the wedding, and shortly after the bride and groom began to dance, I had an attack. I staggered out. I tried to hit the Uber app. I could not do it. I was shaking so hard. My friends witnessed what only my husband has seen the sobbing you can't stop, trying not to scream, doing your natural childbirth breathing so that you can control yourself. Got to the hotel. They wanted to call the paramedics. And I said, please let me get to my room to my medicine, which was medical cannabis. And what I learned is medical cannabis is anti-inflammatory. So my condition's neurological. Instead of the grim side effects associated with opioids, I'm able to take something that actually stops the pain. I've gotten to get up, get dressed, go to a child's ball game, be a semblance of a wife to my husband. And I'm not here for just me. I'm speaking for your constituents all over this wonderful state who are suffering in silence or don't have a husband to care for them and drive them up here because I couldn't get myself here. And finally, I will close with this. Please do not let a spirit of fear keep you from allowing people with legitimate need to go to a doctor and get medical cannabis that will treat their pain or their suffering. Because a no vote basically means our choices are opioids. And I've already discussed what that would mean to me. And if you read the headlines, you know what it will mean to a lot of other people. Please give us a chance to be treated with something that can actually help our conditions. And don't let us creep around in fear, or I'll be 
this very open with you. I truly believe if this sits for years, that every year Emily knows people and I don't even know her. But you will have constituents suffering, dying, many of them taking their own lives because physically there is only so much someone can endure when they are in blinding pain 24-7. So I thank you for your consideration and I would also like to say I have such confidence in Tom Davis and this body of lawmakers that you all can craft a fine bill that is so strictly regulated it will not behoove people to break the law. And I'm so grateful for SLED and our law enforcement who put their bodies in line to protect us every day that they can enforce the legislation that you all come up with. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Richardson. Is Is there there any question? If, uh, Senator from Richland and then Anderson, real quickly. Thank you, Ms. Richardson. I just want to say thank you for coming. Thank you for the courage to say what you've said. And uh, my only regret is that I hope that all of my colleagues, the entire Senate, in fact, the entire General Assembly, um, could have heard your remarks. So. Thank you, God bless you, and thank God for your husband, a great friend, former colleague. Um, but just thank you, very moving, and um, it is, and I would say your testimony and others that I've heard is the reason I support this bill. I'm a pastor, a minister. My father was a pastor and a minister. His father was a deacon. Our whole family, it's a family of ministers. So this is not about religion. Um, this is about what you have spoken of here today. So thank you for coming. And Senator from Buford, Senator Davis, and others who've worked years, and he and I have talked about this and worked on this. So I, I hope and pray that we will get an opportunity to vote on this bill. And I hope and pray that one day you can return to Columbia you can witness a bill signing with the governor. Thank you. May God bless you. Remember, Senator, I wanted you to see that because ultimately what this bill is about, and I'm going to go through every single legal argument that's been put up there, federal preemption, lack of medical evidence, um, unintended societal consequences, and, and take, it, take them all up and discuss them and, and refute them. But I, I, I wanted to keep your mind focused on what we're ap after here is how can people like Margaret Richardson get access to something that clearly helps her safely and legally? How can we, how can we do that? How can, I mean, I've, I've come up with a 49-page bill that I think is pretty tight, that, that, that has protections against abuse, um, that limits the conditions to those for which there's empirical evidence showing that they can be treated by cannabis. But if you've got some other ideas, if you've got ways to make this bill better, I'm open to them. I mean, among the, the, the 45 of us in this room, as, as Margaret Richardson said, we can come up with a carefully crafted bill that enables her, with, in consultation with her physician, to get something that provides her with relief, legally and safely. And, and right after Margaret Richardson testified, a member of the South Carolina Medical Association sat down to testify, and I asked that doctor, I said, you just heard Margaret Richardson's testimony. What would you do if you had a daughter who was howling in pain in bed like an animal, and there was something right on her bedstand that she could take one puff of and the pain would go away, what would you tell her? He goes, I would tell her that we have to wait until the FDA approves this. I said, no, you wouldn't. No, no, you wouldn't. Nobody would. And, and just, I mean, and that's what we're forcing people like Margaret Richards to do, is to break the law and to go out there and buy a dime bag, not knowing what it's in it, not know if it's got, you know, adulterants in it or fentanyl or something that can hurt her, but she has to do it because she's got no other choice. No other choice. Senator from Greenville, Senator Corbin, what purpose do you rise? <clears throat> well, I, wanted to, I didn't want to interrupt the senator. Uh, I'd say so, your remarks, but I, I, would you yield for a quick question? Sure. Because this is in regards to the video. I just want to, I was trying to listen carefully and um, uh, 
make mental notes of what Ms. Richardson was saying. Was I correct when I heard her say that um, there were 58,000 deaths in opioid rated deaths in South Carolina? I think she year. was talking about nationwide. She did say South Carolina, but I think that was nationwide. Okay, thank you. I just would like to make that clarification because I fact checked it over here and that number is way yeah, off. Yeah, no, that, that's a nationwide. Okay, figure. thank you, Senator. Um, Senator from Beaver. All right, so what I'm going to do is, well, I might as well just address the literal elephant in the room here. Um, the Republican Party, my party, um, drafted an email, cut and pasted it for various sheriffs to sign, and then emailed it out to their database and invited you to respond back to the SCGOP, team, team SCGOP, I think it is. And I, I don't understand why, but, but in any event, I'm going to take up the things that they said in that email because... They, they're, they're making their closing argument, right? They're laying out, these are the reasons why you shouldn't vote for this bill. The first one is, they say, marijuana, I'm going to quote, marijuana is an illegal substance. I can't endorse, and I being the sheriff who was at the end of the email, can't endorse or even ignore the attempt to provide relief through illegal methods. All right, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is illegal. Okay, what is legal? What are we authorized to do? What do we have the power as a state to do. Um, and just part of this is Ray Zipka, the, the thing speaks for itself. You've got 36 states, about to become 37 states that have passed it, okay? So there is legal authority, but I'm gonna break it down in detail. The second thing is they say, marijuana is not medicine. Marijuana is based on legitimate research and science, not politics and not feelings. Well, that's true, I mean, Medicine is based on legitimate research and science, and I'm going to go through for each of the qualifying conditions and share with you peer-reviewed medical studies that show how it can be efficacious in regard to treating certain conditions. So I'm going to go to the science. I'm going to go to the, to the legitimate research. I'm not going to do politics and feelings, which I would submit to you is what this email is, okay? Thirdly, and, and this is perhaps the most outrageous misstatement, Impaired driving will only further exacerbate if medical marijuana is legalized. And the reason I say that's outrageous is there have been numerous studies, even by the Department of Transportation, that clearly shows that in states that have legalized cannabis for medicinal purposes, fatalities go down. Impaired driving goes down. Okay, that's not, I mean, that, that's science. That's research. And the reason is that alcohol and, and cannabis are substitute goods, okay? So, so many people treat or, or, or over drink alcohol to mitigate or compensate for conditions, and it's just empirically true, and we'll get into the science of that. A person who is drunk on alcohol is more dangerous behind the wheel than somebody who is under the influence of cannabis. That, that's just a fact, and the statistics bear that out. So I'm not sure where that line, where that comes from, that impaired driving will... Uh, increase uh, if medical marijuana is legalized. All the studies, which I'll go through with five or six of them, shows just the opposite. Next, they say marijuana-based companies largely operate in cash only. So these businesses are more susceptible to armed robberies. I mean, again, that's just false. We, we have experience in states that have had medical cannabis laws. We know what the research, we know what the empirical findings are. And they go down. They go down because of the security that's associated with dispensaries. There, there's not an increase in crimes. There's a decrease. I'll show you that data. It's not just me saying it. It's, it's what the data shows, the report that the studies show. Collecting and remitting taxes based on proceeds that stem from the sale of federally illegal products is problematic. I'm not sure what they mean by problematic, but I'm going to go through the IRS regs that have been issued to provide specific guidance to cannabis industry, cannabis companies, on how they can report their taxes, what are legitimate deductions in terms of expenses. Um, I mean, the IRS is providing guidance. I mean, they give safe harbors <laughs> to, these, to these cannabis established that if you do this, you're, you're fine with us. I'm not sure why remitting, collecting or remitting taxes based on proceeds that sent from the sale of federally illegal products is problematic. I don't understand what that means. But, but I'll talk about that stat, those, uh, those studies that show that, they're not, that there's not an increased robberies. 
I mean, that, that is not problematic. Um, then it says, in a time where law enforcement officers are facing more hatred, mistrust, and even threats to defund and get rid of us, we need support now more than ever. Okay, so, so now we're completely into political buzzword world with defund the police. So defund the police is being brought into this. So I'm going to go through, and this won't come as any surprise to the senator from Spartanburg who chairs that um, subcommittee on finance for law enforcement, but I'm going to show how the recurring appropriations over the last 10 years have gone like that, okay? So if we're defunding the police and if we don't respect the police, we have a funny way of showing it here in South Carolina, okay? And then lastly, well, let's just get into the meat of it now. First, I want to talk about legality of acting. And Senator from Charleston, uh, Senator Campson, I drafted this particular part of my floor argument with you in mind most of all, because you're somebody, I'm not saying the rest of the body isn't, but you're somebody in particular that wants to get, at, you know, nail down what is the state of the law? What are we allowed to do? What are we not allowed to do? I mean, very, very precise in terms of how you approach things. And so I want to talk about the Controlled Substances Act that was passed. And, and the argument has been made by Chief Keel and, and others that the Controlled Substances Act has preempted the field and that states can't, can't act. Well, the first way to rebut that is by looking at the language of the CSA itself. It reads as follows. No provisions of this act shall be construed as indicating an intent on the part of Congress to occupy the field in which that provision operates, including penalties, to the exclusion of any state law on the same subject matter. So, so on its face, the Controlled Substances Act says we're not preempting here. We're not preempting. We're, we're, we inv we're inviting states to also speak in regard to this matter. So there's no express preemption. That's clear. But that's not enough. You've then got two others. You've got an obstacle preemption analysis, okay? And if you can show that there is a conflict between the state and federal law that either creates an obstacle to federal law or makes it physically impossible to comply with both the state and federal law, then that's obstacle preemption and impossibility preemption. And Neither obtains here, and and the case, the case that's that's cited um, almost in every instance when the issue arises um, comes out of Arizona. Um, it was a decision that was handed down. Let's see the date it was handed down here. Twenty twelve case, but I believe it was decided in twenty fifteen. And I'll give you the site. It's um, White Mountain Health Center, Inc. versus Maricopa County. And the, looking for the, I'll have to, I'll have to get you the, um, the citation where it can be found, but I will get that during the, um, during the break. Senator from Charleston, Senator Kempson. Oh. The Senator year four. Oh, there you are. Question. <laughs> question. Are you Senator, you up for a question? Senator, I think it's true, isn't it, that the year is 2016? I, I think it was. Um, and what you're referring to is a, an opinion by the Court of Appeals of Arizona, correct? Correct. And you've already listed the site, but in that opinion, isn't it true that the court walks through the analysis that's applicable to address the federal preemption argument. That's true. And there are a number of other opinions outside of the White Mountain Health opinion that underscore the same principle that the CSA did not expressly preempt the field in this specific area. Yeah, and this case does a good job, Senator from Charleston, of talking about how there's neither obstacle preemption or impossibility preemption because the federal government is not impeded to enforce its law if it wants to. Now, it hadn't 
in the in the 36 states that have that have um, uh, that have passed medical cannabis laws, about to be 37 with Mississippi. You don't see the federal government coming in and making not only not making the express preemption argument because they can't, they're not making the impossibility or obstacle preemption argument either, because it's clear that there's nothing in those laws in those 36 states, nor in this law, that prevents the federal government if it wants to, from enforcing the CSA. Okay, so so preemption just it just doesn't hold. Okay, and there's no case out there that I can find for the proposition that there is preemption. So, so this, this notion that, and some have said, well, you know, I took an oath and, and I have sworn to uphold the U.S. Constitution and the state constitution and I just can't vote for this. Well, you're not, you're not violating your oath, okay? This is an area where the CSA on its face contemplates the states doing things in this area. Uh, as Senator, you Sen my friend. Senator from Charleston, Senator Sin, what purpose do you rise? For a question? For, uh, for, for a question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Senator Buford. Thank you. So I understand what we're arguing as far as preemption, but I think I read in your bill, and I, I admit I've still got about 20 pages left to go in the bill, um, but I see where you have uh, required state and local law enforcement basically not to enforce penalties against cardholders in certain instances. So my question is, though, I guess you're aware that often it's state and local law enforcement that pulls over or, you know, it comes into contact with somebody that they think violates the law. And they arrest them, but then they turn them over to the federal courts for prosecution. So how is that not an obstacle if now state and local law enforcement are not going to be even enforcing federal laws if they come across violations? Because the preemption theory speaks to the inability of the federal government to enforce its laws. It doesn't speak to the impact that third parties or other individuals might have to enforce those laws. It speaks to, are we doing something by state law that makes it impossible for the federal government, if it wanted to, with its, through its agents, to enforce the Controlled Substances Act? But okay, so in the instance you gave, we're not talking about thwarting or presenting an obstacle to the federal government. You're talking about state and, and local law enforcement. Right, and then state and, law, state and local law enforcement, if this bill passes, um, would no longer basically be able to do what it's done for very many years, which is to arrest based on federal violations and then turn it over for prosecution. We're not allowed to yeah. do that anymore. What, what we're doing here is we're creating a legal way for certain categories of patients to access cannabis subject to a physician supervision. That's correct. Now. Senator from Charleston, Senator Kemp. Senator Yield, for, 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 for a question. Before, while we're on preemption, sure. um, could you explain to me why we cannot require a pharmacist to dispense with medical cannabis? I, my, my, my impression was that was a federal requirement that we're preempted, that preempts us from making making that a part of the bill that a pharmacist has to dispense this. Is that is that a issue that the federal government has in fact preempted? It, it's that issue. No, it speaks to the license that's issued to the pharmacist. They get they get a a, a federal um, authorization license to, to dispense and. And so that's why in that context, now you could be a state pharmacist and, and, and not get that federal authorization and, and state, and we're going to talk about that later on, if you're just a state pharmacist, perhaps they could do it. But if you're a federal pharmacist because of that scheduling at the federal level, it would be violative of their, of their permit. So right? that's not the Controlled Substance Act, that's right, another that's, act that does preempt right. us on this issue right. of if we wanted a pharmacist to distribute, because if a pharmacist distributed, I'd have no well, issues and, and whatsoever. And you're, 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 um, and you're getting, and, and I attempted, and, and Senator from Greenville, Senator Loftus uh, mentioned this to me as well, because, and I'm sorry Senator Cromer isn't here because he could add to this as well. There sure is could, a degree yeah. of, of, of knowledge and expertise and skill that pharmacists have that I would like to have at the dispensing level as well. 
Um, and, and I attempted to get at that by saying a dispensary had to employ um, a pharmacist, um, you know, tr trying, to, trying to integrate them into that process. There may be another way if we're just talking about state licensed pharmacists, okay? And I think there's going to be amendment offered or, or looked at that talks about putting it in the hands of, of pharmacists that don't have that federal authorization and don't want it, that they, they would rather do this. And so there may be a way, there may be a way to get there. I assume, I, I don't, I'm not an expert in pharmacy licensure law, but I assume the absence of a federal license may prohibit you from engaging in interstate commerce, which perhaps, I'm probably very, it's probably a very limiting factor. It would, it would limit yeah. the business opportunities of a pharmacist, I assume. Is that correct? Well, you you've, know? Got, you've got three, three states that have pharmacists dispensing or pharmacists being the ones that deliver the, the cannabis product to the patient. And, um, and I really dug into this because the senator from Greenville, Senator Loftus, was, was, was very hung up on this, saying, I want to help you. Sort of like what you're saying. I want, I want to help people like Margaret Richardson, but I would be, feel better if we had pharmacists involved. And so I'm working on an amendment, looking at those three states that have, that have allowed that, and placing them under the, um, uh, the Board of Pharmacy, as opposed to DHEC. And... Um, and, and I don't have that amendment ready yet, Senator from Charleston, but, but it's being worked on. Um, and at some time, at point in time, I will offer that or we can, we can discuss it. Well, I just read in a, that several states, like seven states, have a pharmacy. Even in Connecticut requires a pharmacist yeah. to own a dispensary. Connecticut's one of the three states. I think the other states you're referencing may be doing something what I'm trying, to, what I do in this bill, which is simply require a dispensary to employ a pharmacist. So they got the pharmacist involved. But what you're talking about is going to actually the pharmacist yeah. being the ones that owns the facility and dispenses. I, I and, would like, yeah, and I would like to know what the, yep. I assume there's some negative business consequences to, the, to a pharmacist's business if all they have is a state license. I imagine it might have to do with inter, prohibition on interstate commerce, which it's hard to imagine a pharmacy transaction that does not implicate and involve interstate commerce. Um, what you probably would have if you had this would be pharmacists owned and, and operated doing just medical cannabis probably is what, is what you would have. And, and you'd, you'd see them, you know, they, have to, they would have to take courses in regard to medical cannabis. They'd have, you know, continuing education courses. Um, the cannabis product that they would be dispensing is entirely within the limits of South Carolina. So you don't have that interstate commerce aspect to it. But you make a good, you make a good point because, you know, I want there to be quality control at each step of the process. And we've done a good job in the bill, and I'll go over it in a moment, of, of what does a physician have to do before he or she can authorize cannabis for use by a patient. And, and it's, it's an extremely detailed list. And, you know, in-person diagnosis, uh, counseling in regard to other medications, has traditional pharmaceuticals worked? Have they not worked? Um, what might the side effects be? I mean, it's, it's an exhaustive list. So we got good quality control on that front end. But the dispensing end, or at the, at the end where the patient goes into a dispensary or a quasi-pharmacy and gets the product, um, I would like to have the expertise and the skill of a pharmacist at that level. I, I think that would be valuable. And, and I'm open, and that's one of the reasons I, I, I kind of said at the beginning, I'm open to exploring ways we can make that happen. And I'm going to come up with some language that I think might do it, looking at those states that have done it this way, um, and put that on the desk at some subsequent point. We can discuss that. But I think that's something we can, we can tackle. It, it is, is, is the federal statutory provision or, or federal reg, I'm not, I'm not sure which it might be, um, that prohibits a pharmacist from dispensing medical marijuana, is it because a pharmacist is prohibited from dispensing a Schedule One drug? Is yeah, that yeah. is it, that what yeah. the pharmacy, the Federal Pharmacy Act? I don't know which the name right. of it is, but that's what it provides. That's right. its provision. And and, the, and their license that they get from the federal government, if that's what they do, is predicated upon not being vi not violating that federal law. But but 
what we're talking about here maybe is creating a class of dispensers that are state licensed pharmacists that don't have that federal authorization and don't have that constraint is what we're talking about maybe exploring doing here. I'm just curious. I mean, a pharmacist, a federal pharmacist can dispense Oxycontin. Is that right? Yes. Which is an opioid, right? I think it is. It's very addictive it is. anyway. It is. And so, and I just perusing the history. I know President Obama, um, he basically when it comes to prosecution, and there's prosecutorial discretion, you know, encourage prosecutors or even maybe his attorney general um, gave directives to federal prosecutors, don't, don't prosecute medical cannabis cases. Why, why didn't they just, why didn't they try to, ch to change the federal regulations? This is a federal, this is a federal governmental regulation. It's not a trade association that establishes this, right? right. Why didn't they, why didn't they address the ability, the inability of a pharmacist to dispense this as opposed to a, a, a dealing with it the way that they dealt with it? Because it, it, we wouldn't be even have, we wouldn't be dealing with this if they had done that. It's, it's even it's even worse than that, Senator from Charleston, because for the past seven years. This language has been included in every Appropriations Act passed by Congress. And this is in the DOJ section of the budget. None of the funds made available under four of this act to the Department of Justice may be used with respect to any state, and then it lists all the states, to prevent them from implementing their own laws that authorize the use, distribution, possession, or cultivation of medical marijuana. So. So that's so, not a discretion, that's a mandate. No, no, it's, it's a mandate, and, 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 it's, it's so, and, and that's just routinely now included in the budget every year, that, that the DOJ is prohibited by law from using any of the funds appropriated to it to, quote, prevent any of them, meaning the states, from implementing their own laws that authorize the use, distribution, possession, or cultivation of medical marijuana. Now, now, now that, that particular proviso or budget provision was interpreted in the United States versus McIntosh, which is a federal Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and it ruled that it means what it says, that, that if you are the DOJ, you can't file any action challenging an institution or an entity that is, that is you know, processing, distributing, or growing marijuana pursuant to a state-enacted medical marijuana law. That's a federal budget provision. I mean, and, 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 and again, while we're on this, Congress, I mean, the federal government is acting up there as if, as if this is legal now, okay? You, you've got, for instance, cannabis mergers, okay? They're, they're subject to scru uh, uh, scrutiny by the Department of Justice pursuant to the Hart, Scott, Rodino Antitrust Improvements Act. They've got guidelines and regs that they give to medical cannabis saying this is the way you comply with Department of Justice antitrust rules. Um, you've also got... The IRS, as I indicated earlier, they've issued guidance. There are specific regs that the IRS has issued saying, this is how you file your tax returns if you're a medical cannabis establishment. I mean, the IRS is adjusted. They, it's going on. Well, why don't they want, why don't they just change the reg that let, all, that let pharmacists dispense it? They should, uh, Senator Charleston. Why, why, it why, seems why, like why, instead why of all these other do, things they did, why the way Congress to do it. Why does not do anything? I mean, I, they, yeah. they're just completely dysfunctional. I mean, I, I just, I don't have an answer. Um, FinCEN, Department of Treasury, okay? Department of Treasury, um, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. They issue guidance to banks and credit unions telling them how to treat and how to report monies that are received from cannabis companies and get them the guidelines they need to follow. So you got the Treasury, you got the Justice Department, you've got Congress every year in a budget proviso. Th that, that's why you've got 36 states that have legalized this, and there hasn't been a peep out of the federal government. Not in the executive branch, not in the legislative branch, and not in the judicial branch. And, and this argument that, that, that I want to put to bed here, there's no preemption. The CSA on its face expressly says it is not intended. But they are preempting us from re requiring a federally licensed pharmacist to dispense. Well, that's the, the federal government. Well, if the federal government decides to act in a certain way and put conditions upon 
you know, its authorizations to pharmacists, they're, they're free to yeah, do that. Yeah, but they have done that is right. one, the point. But, 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 the, but what I'm saying is, that the, and, and the case law is clear, in regard to medical cannabis laws, there is no preemption problem. There's not express preemption. There's not implied preemption. There's not obstacle preemption. There's not impossibility preemption. I mean, that, that, that law is clear. So I just, you know, in terms of, you know, talking about this bill, I wanted to make it very clear from the start that what is our authority? What, what is our ability here? What do we have the right to do? And then we can talk about whether or not we want to do it. But I wanted to start with, with that, to, to reassure you all that we can, we can act if this body wants to. Well, the reason I, I, I'm inquiring this cause, is, number one, you know way more about this than me because you have focused on this for years. But um, a, pharmacy, a pharmacist being involved is important from my perspective. And what a, a pharmacist, a doctor can prescribe and a pharmacist can dispense Oxycontin. They all, a, pharma, a doctor prescribing and a pharmacist dispensing medical marijuana is certainly no worse than Oxycontin when it comes to addiction and that type of thing. But it's really frustrating to me that we don't have the ability to require the pharmacists to do the dispensing because I do trust a pharmacist. They're medically trained, they're professionals. I do place more trust in, in it not being kind of someone who's really just you know, doesn't have that medical background yeah, I running a dispensary and and if and that's that's why I've asked this line of questioning because no. to me that's really important to have that pharmacist and that, that medical training, that professional standards at that point and not the guy who, I'm not going to say, I don't want to be pejorative, but in some instances, I've, in some instances, you know, it could be, in worst case, it could be the guy who was the, who was the pusher last week is now running a dispensary this week, you know. In some states, that has been the case, I think, the early states who did this. So, so a lot more faith if it's a pharmacist. That's really why I'm asking this question. I'm, I'm sincerely trying to get a sense of what the playing field is, is like when it comes I, And You're I helping share, me a lot. I share your desire in bringing the skill and expertise and the experience of pharmacists into that critical moment when cannabis is given to a patient for a medical condition. I, I, I share that. I hear that. And, and I'm working on something that I think does that and we can debate it. I, I just, I don't have that amendment ready, but you're right to point to that because it's always made me, we, we have good regulations on, on tight regulations, which I'll talk about in regard to the growing, the processing, um, and we have tight regulations in regard to the written authorization from a physician and what, what has to happen. I, I struggle a little bit with the, with, not struggle, but, but I'm challenged with how do we bring that degree of scrutiny and, and regulation to the actual dispensing? Well, Senator, since, there's, you, you have just expressed a litany of areas of law, of federal law, that the federal government is just not enforcing, um, exercising not Providing more, guidance. I mean, providing guidance. Providing I mean, guidance. The Treasury Department, and, I mean, they're providing guidance. Which is not discretion. Discretion, by definition, discretion requires the evaluation of a particular set of facts and circumstances and then exercising your independent judgment whether I should pursue prosecution of this case or not. It, discretion is not, prosecutorial discretion is not directed from above to not prosecute an entire class and categories of federal offenses. That is not discretion, but that's what's happening. What would be the chance if, if we were the first state to require a, a, a pharmacist um, to dispense? They, they've basically categorically not enforced anything else that, that is an impediment to medical cannabis. I wonder what the feds would do there think, if we did that. Well, you, you just give me a good homework assignment to not only look at those, those three states that have this pharmacist-controlled dispensing process, but, but finding out what have been the real world consequences in, in, in that regard. And I'll find that out for and you. And it may be, it may be a, li a pharmacist's license being revoked and phar most pharmacists probably wouldn't want to put themselves, their business at risk like that perhaps, but, but 
They've ignored everything else, yeah. um, perhaps. But that, but that, that pharmacist is an important component, Senator. And thank you for your. I understand. I, I don't want. I'm going to let you continue. Sure. And I, I think my friend Senator from Edgefield had a question. You don't. Okay. Um. Senator from Anderson, Senator Cash, what purpose do you rise? If the Senator were you for a question on this point? Yes, Senator Yields. Senator Yields. All right, so um, I listened to a lot in the subcommittee as well as the full committee on this. Now, this discussion about preemption and the Controlled Substances Act, um, I don't recall this at all. So this is new to me, okay? I, I just did not pick up the nuances of what's being talked about here, although I think it's an important subject. So and part seemed, of that's probably my fault, Senator from Anderson, in, in that um, I've worked on this for so long that, that I just move on to the things that I think are, are still, um, you know, debatable. And so, but I'm going back to kind of first principles here now, and I'm, I'm talking about our authority to act because I want this body to have the benefit of all my thought process throughout the seven years. Well, I think that's the place to start. Now, what I think I heard you say is that the Controlled Substances Act, and that's a 1970 bill, correct? Something like that? 71, I believe. What I've written down here is that it anticipates the states doing something differently than the federal government or that it provides for the states doing something differently than the federal government. I mean, what was the argument you're making? I, I, yeah, I heard it, I've just heard this one time and it's, uh, it's just not sticking. So what, what is it you're saying? Okay, so in, in the Controlled Substances Act itself, okay, 21 U.S. Code Section 903, application of state law, it states as follows. No provision of this ch subchapter shall be construed as indicating an intent on the part of Congress to occupy the field in which that provision operates, including criminal penalties to the exclusion of any state law on the same subject matter, okay? So, so in regard to the Controlled Substances Act, okay, that's what we're talking about here. It is not the intent of Congress to preempt the field. It expressly declares that it's not preempting the field. It expressly says this cannot be read in such a way so as to interfere to the exclusion of any state law in the same subject matter. Okay, so, but, but again, as I said to the senator from Charleston, that's express preemption, okay? There's no express preemption, because sometimes Congress does that in, in, in their bills. They say, we intend to occupy the field here. Um, and in that case, you know, the supremacy clause of the U.S. Constitution means, okay, the federal law, that's, that's the law. But what you have to do further, though, is look at implied preemption, okay, which, which means that by the very language of the bill itself, that if you passed a state, a state law that prevented the federal law from being enforced by the federal government, okay, that would be, that would be obstacle preemption, okay? So even in cases where- That would where be what? Obstacle, it's called obstacle preemption. Obstacle. Obstacle. So even in cases where the federal law doesn't expressly say we preempt, if the state passes a law that makes it impossible for the federal government to enforce a federal statute, that is implied preemption or so-called obstacle preemption. But, but my point here is, in, in the cases that decide this preemption question, whether it's, whether it's um, express or implied, in the area of medical cannabis laws, they have found there is no preemption. And, and, they, and again, I, I, could, I could go through and read you, I've got seven or eight highlighted quotes from that court case that I, um, but I will just refer you to the case. And, um, and again, the, the case is, I think I do have the site in here now. Yes, um, White Mountain versus Maricopa, uh, 241, Arizona, 230. And it's a Court of Appeals case of 2016. And it provides just an excellent, you know, multi-page analysis of why preemption does not exist in the area of the Controlled Substances Act when it comes to a state's medical cannabis laws. And so I, I say all that because I know that members of this body have concerns about doing things that are contrary to federal law. I mean, they respect the federal law. There's a supremacy clause in the Constitution. So my, my point here is to say there is no preemption here which is in large measure why you've seen 36 states take advantage of this. And, and, um, and, and I just got to point this out, if I can put my hands on it quickly. Um, 
because it is so fresh. Mississippi, okay, on January 19th, the Mississippi House of Representatives passed a medical marijuana bill that's a lot more liberal than this one, a lot more conditions, allows smoking. I mean, doesn't have all the things I've built into this bill. That House in Mississippi passed it 104 to 14. The state Senate passed it 45 to 5. Mississippi. So, and the reason for that is there's legal authority for states to act. There's no preemption. There is overwhelming medical evidence that cannabis can be a medicinal benefit in, in ways that, in some instances, pharmaceuticals cannot. And there have not been the parade of horribles or the societal consequences that I've heard some out in the lobby say will happen if, if God forbid, we pass a medical cannabis law and allow people like Margaret Richardson to access medicine safely and legally. I mean, so that's why you've seen this happening. And you've got other states right now that are taking this issue up as well, as we are. North Carolina, just to the north, is taking it up as well. Let's not be the 50th state to do this. I mean, we're better than that. I mean, and, and what we have, I mean, we just got done passing a repeal of certificate of need. And, and I chaired that subcommittee. And we heard testimony from DHEC and people that administer the certificate of need program. And I wanted to hear it. And, and some of them weren't in favor. And they, and they gave the reasons why they weren't in favor. And I was fine with that because DHEC is an important player in this committee process. But what, how would you feel if the director of DHEC dispatched DHEC employees throughout the state to go to Rotary clubs and other civic meetings and make arguments against a piece of legislation seeking to repeal CON? Would you think that that was something that DHEC ought to do? Because I tell you what, that is what SLED is doing. SLED is sending out their, their sworn officers going to Rotary Clubs, telling untruths about this bill. This bill doesn't even allow smoking, but they talk about smoking. They bring, they bring, bring big blowtorches in and say this is what they use. I mean, the fear... The, the, the naked political posturing of it, it, it offends me that our state dollars and our law enforcement is going out across the state giving presentations on this. I welcome their participation in the committee process. I think the bill became a lot better by listening to SLED. But would we tolerate it if DHEC sent people out there to argue against CON? No, we wouldn't. That isn't that a that proper use of, of, of state money. They also, I'm sorry, you got me on this now, and I, I, I well, I didn't get you on that. Well, no, now. I know, but I, I, but I'm, I'm, I'm following through this train of thought because it's, I got to get it off my chest. When we have these subcommittee meetings, and 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 mothers with their kids, sometimes in wheelchairs, you know, I mean, I mean, just, I mean, just break your heart. They wait out in the hallway because sled and the sheriffs took up every seat in the committee room not to offer testimony, but to bully, to sit there glowering. Did you notice in that, in that, that, that the testimony that Margaret Richardson gave, you see who was right behind Margaret Richardson, staring at her, yawning during her testimony? That is not what they should be doing. All right, I'm done with that. Go ahead. All right, so... If I understand your argument, I'm going to put this in, in my words, and you correct me if, if, uh, if I'm not saying it right, that even though this is a Schedule One substance, uh, that in the Controlled Substances Act, it provides for states your argument is that it provides for states to have different and perhaps conflicting laws from the federal law? Is that what your yeah, it's, it's, argument is? Well, it's, it's, it's not even my argument. It's, it's what the language of the Controlled Substances Act well, says. I, I understand you've read the language, but again, I, 
I'm, I'm going to sit down here in a minute because uh, there may be attorneys who would not agree with your interpretation of the text who want to take it up with you. I, I, it, it's, it gets too nuanced for me to uh, try to interpret uh, that phrasing there. But that I'm just saying or trying to sum up that that's what your argument is, is that the federal government has not claimed exclusive control of law right. over Schedule I substances that it, that it provides for in the very act that states can disagree with them. Is that what you're, that, that's is that what I, the argument? That's what I'm saying, and that's what courts have ruled, okay? When confronted with this very question, Arizona, their medical marijuana law, there was an argument made that it conflicts with the Controlled Substances Act and, because, and, and the CSA, the argument went, preempts the field, so Arizona could not act. Court reject, rejected that argument and, and, and gave a very good analysis. And I would submit to you, find me one decision, one, one decision that's out there where a state cannabis law has been struck down because of federal preemption. There isn't one. There isn't one. Because there's no preemption. But I, but I make that, I, I go back and make that argument because, as, as I said about Senator Peel early on, I don't want to appeal just to your hearts, okay, or emotions. I want to lay down the solid framework for this bill, and that starts with what is our authority? What is our ability? What can we do? To recap, to recap your statements here about the budget, I believe what you said is that in the last seven years, every budget has included this proviso, and I'm assuming that what, what you're indicating is every budget and every continuing resolution, because we haven't had budgets in every it's, seven years, we're, right? We're, we're operating under a continuing resolution now, and this proscription against using DOJ funds um, against state medical cannabis laws is part of that continuing resolution. I mean, it's not even debated anymore, Senator Anderson. It's, it's just, it's, it's sort of like some of these, these things that are in our state budgets. They just, they're there forever. Once they're there, they're there. And they don't even get debated. Um, but yes, that is, that is currently the state of the law. It's, it's in part of that continuing resolution. And so, uh, if you take the language of that resolution, would I be wrong to say that the federal government's almost promulgating anti-commandeering language against itself? That we have this Schedule I substance, and now we're telling our own uh, Department of Justice that no money can be appropriated uh, to implement or enforce those laws. It's almost anti-commandeering language yeah. against itself. Is that? And I think I think the reason for that say? is, and, and we've seen that recently um, with um, with some of the legislation in Congress, they attempt to do things through the budget or do things through reconciliation, because it's a it's a it's a lower threshold you have to clear, and and so to get bills out of committee that would codify this instead of it being a budget proviso is apparently too difficult a lift to happen in Congress right now. But the fact remains that it is the law of the land that the Department of Justice can't challenge these state laws. They're proscribed expressly by Congress. Every year for the last, I think it's the last seven years. I mean, it's, it's been seven or eight years. Well, Senator, I I uh, appreciate your response to my questions. I'm sure I'll have some more questions as we go along. Uh, and, you know, did you know that I did vote to, to pass this bill onto the floor, but did you know that I have indicated at every step of the way that although I'm open-minded about it, I, I reserved and still do, you know, the right to make a final decision after hearing all the debate including the debate of those who are against this, I want to hear all of it, and seeing the final form of this bill after all the amendments are said and done with, and that, that remains my position, did you know? You, you've always made that clear, Seth Manderson. Senator from Clarendon, what purpose do you want? Right? Thank you, Mr. President. I want to see if the Senator will yield for yes, a few sir. questions. Senator uh, Yielson, question. At some point, I plan to speak uh, on this bill, but I did have a few questions, um, and I will just preface my remarks by saying, I guess I'll say, did you know but years ago when we had the debate on the cannabis oil that apparently helped a lot of, especially children, with seizures, did you know that I did vote for that bill? Uh, if not, I'll just remind you that I did. 
But Senator, there's been a lot of talk about um, that we've been at this for seven years, right? Seven years. And I think you will uh, agree that I have commended you a couple of times on the work that you have done, although I still stand against the bill, on the work that you have done with this bill from the first time we started debating this bill up until now. And did you know that I tell people every day that although I'm against this bill, still remain against it, um, the bill before us today is a, is a far better bill than what we started with back when I was on the subcommittee with you. I got somehow got taken off the subcommittee. But the question I have is, because it has been seven years, and I was just sitting here thinking, um, that's a lot of time. And in those seven years, am I right that the Food and Drug Administration has done nothing to uh, reschedule uh, this bill so that it can be a legal medicine for people in need for it? Am I right about that? It's, it's not been rescheduled. Okay. In seven years, has anything been done to allow physicians to uh, write prescriptions for medical marijuana? At the federal level. Right. No, not at the federal level. And then in seven well, years... Well, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me rephrase that. I think that there has been federal action because, again, every year in the budget and also in the, appropriate, in, the, in the continuing resolutions, there is an express prohibition against the Department of Justice challenging states that have passed medical cannabis laws. So, so that, in a way, is a green light to states okay. to pass these laws which in turn empower physicians. So, so yes, there has been federal okay. action. There. I accept that, but I think what I'm asking is, after all of this time and all this work that has been done, physicians still cannot write a prescription for marijuana. And what, and I, the well, what, what, what they can do in states that have adopted medical cannabis laws is they, they write out written authorizations. That's not called a prescription. It's, right. a, it's a written authorization. Right. And I'm gonna go into it in a minute, you know, what has to precede that authorization and the degree of diligence a physician has to employ. But, but you're right, not, not prescription in the sense that FDA in, in calls the sense, a Right, drug. in the sense that I take a lot of medication right. and I can go to my doctor and get refills, he can write prescriptions and I can take it to the pharmacist. That's not the case, is it, for medical marijuana or for marijuana, I'll put it that way. I think, I think it's the case, and the Senator from Charleston was saying, there are, there are some states that do have pharmacies and pharmacists that dispense. I, I guess I meant to say in South Carolina, I'm yeah. sorry. No, in South Carolina. And so is it also true that after all this work for seven years, uh, pharmacists can still not dispense marijuana? Is that right? In South Carolina? In South Carolina. No, in South Carolina they cannot. And then um, I heard your, um, and I think I was on the committee when the young lady spoke, and, and you know, I'm compassionate, I really am, and I would just say, for the record, to the body, did you know that um, I've never tried marijuana, don't know what it feels like, I don't like the way it smells, but um, I'm just concerned because, did you know when I was on the subcommittee, and even after then, um, there's been all type of studies and data and statistics, uh, some in favor of mer medical marijuana, as you alluded to, and I'm sure you will give us some more, but there have also been some of uh, the same type of information, studies, data, research, whatever, that has spoken against. And I heard your remarks earlier about um, uh, people driving on the highway having had marijuana, and, and I'm gonna find it before I go to the podium, but did, did you know that I have some information that shows that people out uh, on the highways and roads under the influence of marijuana have caused a great, build, a great deal of damage in South Carolina. I wanted to know if you were aware of that. No, I mean, it's not my argument that, that people who are under the influence of marijuana can't be involved in traffic accidents. My argument is against what the South Carolina Republican Party circulated out there saying that they would go up if medical marijuana was legalized, that the incidents would go up. And, and, and in fact, I'll go into that right now since you're bringing it up, but, but it turns out that they'd go down, okay, and empirically there's three or four different studies, including one by the federal government, that shows that traffic accidents and fatalities go down in medical marijuana states because alcohol and marijuana are substitute goods, or substitute, I mean, economics, you've heard of substitute or, or complementary goods. It's, it's a substitute good. And you can see a marked decrease 
in fatalities in cases that have medical cannabis laws. I mean, so I'm not saying they can't be in accidents, but I'm saying that on the whole, the statement that it's going to spike isn't borne out by the data. Okay, I, I only asked that, did you know, because I was in Charlotte uh, over Thanksgiving uh, weekend, uh, did you know, and I got rear-ended. And I jumped out of my truck and I uttered some words that my family never heard me utter. <laughs> and when I got out the truck to see what the problem was, there was a strong odor of marijuana coming from the young lady's car that ran in the back of me. And I really believe that contributed to that accident. But the other question I wanted to ask, because I, I heard you mention about SLED, and, and I will say I have talked, I have spoken to SLED a number of times about this bill because I share some of their concerns. But I just wanted to ask because I don't know, and I know SLED has been very forthcoming and truthful to me and those types of things. And, you know, at one time, uh, earlier version of this bill, it allowed for, I guess we would call um, a smokable version of marijuana. So I'm, I'm just wondering, was that when SLED was going around the state saying and talking about smoking marijuana, or was it after you took that out? I'm asking that question just out of curiosity. I met with him, I met with Chief Keel um, and, and also with representatives from SLED over time. Um, at what point in the process did it come out? I, I don't know. A couple, okay. I want to say I want to say a couple years ago, but it got taken out. I guess my point is because that's something they said. Look, we don't want this, and and um, and I'm like, okay. I mean, I, I I want to come up with a bill here that's reflective of concerns, and I hear what you're saying that individuals who are smoking a joint, okay, they want to be able when they see that to immediately infer that it's illegal. And if you're allowed to burn leaf recreationally, they wouldn't be able to make that determination visually, right? So, so they, they wanted that taken out. And, and quite frankly, a lot of the advocates and the people that have been put were angry about it getting taken out. But, but my point has always been, this isn't going to be Colorado or Washington. It's, it's going to be South Carolina's bill. And it's going to be, and it is a lot more tightly regulated and conservative than even the one Mississippi's about to pass. But that's okay because that, that's what I told this body I was going to come up with. And, um, and there's going to be a part of my presentation where I talk about all the concessions that we've made. Yeah, I, and, 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 and I agree. And, and again, I, I admit that there have been a lot of concessions that were made. And I would go so far as to say, did you know that a lot of folks who have been contacting me uh, over the years in favor of this bill are going to be very upset when they realize what the bill entails now because a lot of the folks that, um, that contacted me, uh, just to be completely honest, did you know, they saw this bill as a way to get marijuana and they could just sit around and smoke and get high on all day and not knowing that, and still probably don't know, we're talking about oils and creams and those types of things. So, so they're gonna be upset when they realize all of the enhancements that you've made to the bill and they can't just sit around and get marijuana and smoke it. But um, you made a, um, a, and and I, I, I do feel for people who um, who have issues. I've been suffering with some uh, excruciating back pains for the last couple of years. I'm getting injections. I'm taking the pills. And I made a joke, and it was just a joke, did you know, to send in the huddle one time. And I said, you know, if I thought it would help my back, I'd try some medical marijuana. But that was just a joke. I wouldn't do that. But um, you made a... Um, well, let, me ask, let me stop you for a minute and ask you this. Would you agree that it isn't the moral thing to do to help somebody like Margaret Richardson to safely and legally access something that clearly can help her? Don't, well, don't, you, don't you think that it's our job to come up with a way to make that a reality? Let me answer the question this way. It's a good question. And you made a good point, and I am compassionate, and I know people who suffer pain and those types of things. And you, made an, you gave an example of if someone, if I had a loved one, for example, uh, that was laying in bed, sick, in pain, whatever, and there was something that I could get, even if it was illegal, to um, help them, to ease their situation. And I thought about that, did you know? And I thought about one person in particular that I happen to know. It's actually in prison right now. And it wasn't pain or medical marijuana, but they did have family members who were sick, they were hungry, they probably didn't have a lot of the necessities in life, they were desperate. And so they did probably what maybe the average person would do, and they committed a crime, 
to provide for their family. And while I can empathize with that, I, and I, this may be comparing apples to oranges, but I mean, some, some, some of that happens in other instances. I just can't advocate that a person will commit a crime. But, but in that instance, Senator, you're talking about a crime against taking the property of somebody else. In the example I gave, the, the crime I, I, you're talking about is, 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 the, is the state's absence of a law that allows a physician to, to, let, I, to, to, to have access. But my point was, and I, I, I mean, I, I won't speak for you. I'll speak for myself. If, if I had a daughter that was screaming in pain, no pharmaceuticals could mitigate that pain, and there was, there was marijuana there that would get rid of that pain like that, like it does for Margaret, you're damn right I'd give it to her. And you know I what, would. Senator, did you know that, that I probably would too? But I probably would, but it would bother me, did you know, because it would still be illegal, but I understand that. But I'm trying to make it easier I for understand, you now, I understand. It illegal. But the okay? other thing is, because we're talking about trying to do things to help people, and you know, I, I, I mentioned, uh, do you remember when we discussed, debated the Certificate of Need Bill? I'm at Medicaid. No, I'm getting to that in a second, I'm gonna I take my seat. Fine. But but the Certificate <laughs> of Need Bill, and I said one of the things that formed my opinion were two things, were talking to my, my hospital officials back home and other hospital administrators in rural communities, but it bothered me that the South Carolina Medical Association also came out against the bill, and I'm wondering uh, who in here, and there may be some, but who in here knows more about uh, what's important for hospitals, particularly in rural areas, than the South Carolina uh, Medical Association. And so now here I am now, we're debating medical marijuana, and I'm listening, did you know, to four or five uh, friends of mine who are healthcare professionals that I have a lot of respect for, and they, they've given me some horror stories about medical marijuana. I may share some later on. I'm listening to sheriffs in the counties I represent, and other counties throughout South Carolina. I'm listening to police chiefs, and I'm listening to uh, other folks who I think would have SLED, law enforcement, uh, more of, a, a, of an understanding, I'll just speak for me, than I do as far as uh, medical marijuana is a good thing or not. But I'm gonna close, because you, you brought it up, but I was gonna bring it up anyway. The other question I Before have- Before we move on to that, let me, okay. let me respond. I tell you who does know more. That physician sitting down with that patient, examining that patient, reviewing that patient's um, medical history, looking at whether or not pharmaceuticals have helped, that relationship, that relationship is the one we ought to be exalting. That relationship knows best. Are you trying to, are you, are you, I don't think you're trying to say that SLED and law enforcement knows more about what's in that patient's best interest than a physician sitting there and counseling with that patient? Are you saying that sheriffs know more? I, I, I grant you that, but, but you're making my argument now that I'm going to make when we start debating abortion again about who knows best what's good for that pe person sitting around that kitchen table. So I grant you that. But we, I'm not going to try to uh, be a broken record on Medicaid expansion, but I said it during certificate of need. I've said it every time we have talked about um, medical marijuana. And I still believe, did you know, that if we really want to help people who have health care issues in South Carolina, that we ought to expand Medicaid. Now, you mentioned about not, not, less, not let South Carolina be the last state to adopt a medical marijuana law, but I think we're only one of two states that have not expanded Medicaid. And I'm telling you, I live with these folks. I see them in my community. Did you know? They're not looking for a handout. They work. We can't raise the minimum wage. They make Minimum wage, a little bit more. Some of their jobs, did you know, don't offer health insurance. Some that do, they can't afford it. And the last I checked, we can immediately help improve the life of two to 300 South Carolinians if we expand Medicaid. And what, what, what kind of concerns me, did you know, is that most of the folks who are for repealing certificate of need, and that's fine, that's a done deal, and that's good. Had some amendments that made the bill better. But then, and then most of the people who want to people have access to marijuana to help them health-wise, I can't even get a hearing to give people Medicaid. And it's just, it baffles me, so, so I feel like, did you know, as I take my seat, if I'm for repealing CON, and if I'm for medical marijuana, 
I should be for Medicaid expansion. It's, there, there are a lot of benefits to individuals and to the state of South Carolina to expand Medicaid, and I, I still submit to you, uh, Senator, as I uh, applaud all your great work in this area, that the, uh, the, the bill that helps people health-wise in South Carolina more than any bill that I've addressed since I was in the Senate, which has not been long, 10 years, is Medicaid expansion. And, and, and I can't even get a hearing on the bill. Let me make this commitment to you, and I think I made it to you, you did. during you did. the CON. Um, when it comes to health care, there are two sides of the equation. You've got supply and demand. CON was know. talking about supply. You're right to look, say, that's half the equation. We ought to look at the demand side. And, and if there are people who are unable, don't qualify for Medicaid, or can't get insurance through the exchange, the so-called pocket that's in there, I am open up to ways to empower them so that they can access health care. Where, where I would differ with you slightly is I don't think expanding Medicaid is the most efficient way to get there. But I agree with you in principle that if there are people that don't have access to health care, we ought to figure out who they are and how best to help them. And I'll join you in, in, make, in having that debate. I want to have that debate. I don't want, I don't want people to go without health care. I mean, that, I, I don't. And, and, and I know that and I appreciate that, but did you know I keep raising that point because a lot of bills that are debated here, uh, a lot of the, the, the argument for this bill or that bill is what other states have done. And I'm saying, again, are you aware that I think there's only two states left that have not expanded Medicaid, and also did you know that as far as medical marijuana, I think it's like 12 or 13 states that have not uh, passed a medical marijuana bill. And did you also know that most of the states in the Southeast, particularly we always compare ourselves to Georgia and North Carolina, have not passed a medical marijuana bill? I, 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 think, I think we're better than that. Okay. I think, and, 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 and since you, you asked some good questions, and you, you got me thinking about the doctor-patient relationship, okay, and about, about what this bill does more than anything else, it exalts that relationship, okay? It, it is, unlike, unlike any other state bill that legalizes medical cannabis, this has got such an emphasis on the physician, such an emphasis on that inpatient diagnosis, makes them go through a litany of, of things. First, you have to, it's almost like the right to try legislation, Senator Johnson, there has to be a finding by that doctor that the patient has not responded through pharmaceuticals. I mean, so, so it's, it's, again, it is very, very tight. And, I, and ironically, just a few months ago, the South Carolina Republican Party was railing against the CDC or the FDA or Anthony Fauci saying, they can't tell doctors what they can give these patients. That doctor do, does it in that patient's best interest. So if they want to give them, you know, ivermectin or if they want to give them some other therapeutic, that's between that doctor and that patient. Now I'm, hearing, now I'm hearing that even if a physician wants to do it, oh no, it's cannabis. It's marijuana. We, we, we can't allow that. I mean, to me, that's not intellectually consistent. It's, it just S isn't. Senator from Lexington, Senator Sheely, what purpose do you rise? You for, yield for two, three very short, very friendly questions. I will yield for as long as you want me to. Senator Yield. We'll be very short and very friendly. Um, Senator, did you know that I know that you've worked very hard on this piece of legislation. Hours and hours and years and years and, oh, I can't tell you how long I know that you've worked on this. And do, did you know that I know that you have done almost everything you can do to satisfy everybody in the state of South Carolina? Did you know I know that? Yes, and, and, and let me say this, although I do get frustrated what I think is improper advocacy by SLED, I appreciate their involvement in this process because good legislation comes out of active opposition. Good legislation comes from somebody challenging your assumptions and making you think through things. And so I, I am grateful to SLED for engaging with me on this bill. I'm grateful to the South Carolina Medical Association for engaging to me. But to your point, it has become, I mean, th this bill truly is going to be the template for any state that wants to empower doctors. Any state that wants to get medicine in the hands of people who can benefit from it, but wants to draw that bright line against any sort of adult use or recreational use, this is going to be the gold standard because 
That's what we've been drafting for the past seven years. Right. That, that's, been, that's been our objective. Do you remember me coming to your office? I, I hated the thought of medical marijuana. And do you remember me coming to your office and giving you my list of problems I had? And, 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 and the problems that you had, to your credit, because this is something you care deeply about, about children, you wanted to make sure that the products weren't designed in a way so as to appeal to children, the form of edibles. You didn't like the type of advertising and marketing where you had, you know, huge marijuana leaves and you had all sorts of, you know, um, unsavory or unesthetic things. And I liked those amendments because if it's medicine, which it is, you ought not to have that extraneous stuff. It ought to be in bottles, labeled with what's on it, dispensed in a professional setting without all those other things. And so we've added that section in there. Um, and you made the bill a lot better because I sat down with you, and I sat down with Laurel Hudson and did the same thing. Right. And, and, and every, every one of her, every one of the things she gave me, I put in there, but it's like whack-a-mole. They, they answered, well, no, we still don't like it. I mean, so, look, I appreciate the fact that they've engaged in the process. I'm presenting to you a, a work product right now that we can be proud of. And, and, and to the point, you, you made the other day, you asked about Alzheimer's. Or, or, or neurological diseases. And, and, and I'm just going to tell you, this is from the um, National Institute of Health, U.S. National Library of Medicine. I'm going to read from a, um, a medical abstract that was published on February 3, 2017. Alzheimer's disease is a debilitating neurodegenerative disease that is affecting an increasing number of people. It is characterized by the accumulation of amyloid and tau hyper phosphorylation, help me with that, Senator from Orangeburg, I think that's right, as well as neuroinflammation and oxidative stress. Current Alzheimer's treatments do not stop or reverse the disease progression, highlighting the need for new, more effective therapeutics. Cannabis has demonstrated neuroprotective, anti-inflammatory, and antioxidant properties. Senator, did it, you know that Alzheimer's is an increased plaque on the brain? It's what it is. And nobody in this room probably understands Alzheimer's better than I do because I go home every night and deal with Alzheimer's. So if I thought that this could help my husband, we would do what we could do to help him. So I agree with you. But here's, here's what I really got up to say. I wish that we could go through this legislation, and hear what you've come up with, and then let's talk about what we can do maybe to make it better instead of stopping every two minutes. And I'm sorry, I said I no, would ask two course. questions, and I asked more. I'm happy Thank to you. yield to my friend from Charleston. Well, let me, I got the, sen I got the senator from um, Orangeburg, Senator Stevens it's first, and then, then I'll come to the senator from Charleston. Mr. President. So uh, what purpose do you rise, Senator from Orangeburg? Actually, to ask, uh, uh, Senator to yield for a question or two, but Senator, just hearing what uh, does the Senator uh, does the Senator yield? Senator yields. Okay. Yes, sir. Just hearing what Senator Sheely said about listening and then coming back and asking questions later, I'm going to yield to that. Okay. Thank you. Thank oh, you. Okay. So Senator does not want the Senator from Charleston. Senator Sin, what purpose do you rise? Uh, Mr. President, to see if he would yield. Senator, for, Senator for a question. For, um, for a question. For a question. Thank you, okay. yes. yes. With all due respect to the senator from Lexington, after she asks questions and then doesn't want us to ask questions, <laughs> um, I do understand her point, but I did want to ask something in response to actually what Senator Sheely was asking. Um, I remember, and I'm sure you do, listening to testimony, I think it was probably three or four years ago. I was not even on medical affairs, but I was interested and sat in and listened to a lot of pro and con testimony on this bill. And I do remember back then they, some people from Arizona uh, and maybe Colorado came and gave some stats and data about the people that were actually card holders in their area. And I wanted to follow up on that because I was pretty astonished. Um, you tell me if you remember it like this, but I remember hearing that the overwhelming number of cardholders were kids or people under the age of 25 um, who were claiming chronic pain. And I'm going to get on to this. Now I've got some new data in my hands. I'm looking at the 2021 Arizona Marijuana Active Card data um, from there. And... Therein, it says that of all the cardholders in Arizona in 2021, 0.04% were Alzheimer's patients. 
zero four. Are you aware of that? In, in what state? I'm sorry. Arizona, 2021. And I, I think it is probably unfair for me not to give you a copy of this. I will. Um, but do you generally remember, and, and to your knowledge, does it generally hold true, that the overwhelming people who get these marijuana cards are claiming chronic pain, and many of them, the data in this particular thing says 30 and under. I remember hearing testimony it was 25 and under, but this appears that 94.2% are people under age 30 claiming chronic pain. So it's not no. the cancer patients and... No, well, let me respond to that if I can. Yes, sir. Sorry. Um, in, two, in two ways I would respond. Um, first of all, this is South Carolina's law, and our universe of qualifying conditions is much more constrained than in other states. The second thing I would say is we do allow it to be used for chronic pain, but it has to be tied to a diagnosable and certified physical ailment or, or condition by a physician. So... so, so I can't speak to what might happen in other states because they have either loose definitions of qualifying conditions or if they've got loopholes. What I can tell you, Senator from Charleston, is I've drafted this language, and I guess now's a good time to go through it, with an eye toward not allowing it to be a farce, not allowing it to be gamed. I mean, and, and that's really earned me a lot of opponents um, who are for legalization, okay, because they say this is too tight. It, it, it places too high a bar to qualify. I don't apologize for that because this is something new. I think it's important that we proceed cautiously. I think it is something that is very important to give patients the option to help people out like Mark and Richardson. But I want to err on the side of being cautious. So, so when, when, when statistics are cited about, well, this is what happened in Arizona or this is what happened in California or Colorado, I guess my only response back can be, that's a consequence of the law that they passed. I'm going to speak to what the law we got before us here is, because as we go through it, I think you're going to see it's even gotten tighter since when you were on medical affairs. Are you still on medical affairs? I'm on are. medical affairs now. No, I was not okay. then. I was just interested. But, but, but I, I think, you know, and, and this is frustrating to me as well. Um, you know, the Palmetto Family Council, you know, just put out a, a big Facebook ad talking about, you know, secondhand smoke, marijuana. You can't burn. You can't smoke in this bill. Right. It's like it's... It's frustrating to me that they didn't even bother to read the legislation before they send out flyers. Right, but I've read it. You can eat gummies, you can eat brownies, you can have all sorts of edibles there and oils. Certain, there are certain edibles, and we'll talk about that, mm -hmm. but there are also And I do want to let you get to continuing on. Um, so I'll just, I'll, I'll just want to say that, I, like everybody else in here, I appreciate your efforts. You came to me as well asking if you could satisfy my concerns. My concerns were, and I'm sure you'll remember, that I wanted a doctor to be able to definitively point to an objective medical illness, and not just an objective medical illness, an objective serious medical illness. And what I read in this legislation does not do that. Um, it, it basically says that, you even say that um, law enforcement officers and all first responders automatically qualify um, if they want, because they would have come across some traumatic incidents. They don't have to prove that they've had a traumatic incident. Same with combat veterinarians. But anybody can go to the doctor and say, I've had a traumatic incident. And every single one of us in this world has had a traumatic incident. And the same would go with chronic pain. I can go to the doctor and tell him, my knee hurts. I go back the next week, you know, my knee's still hurting. It's been hurting for six years. I got chronic pain. So... One of what? the things I would say, Senator, is if, if you look at the definition of debilitating medical conditions, um, sub-item 13, that speaks to chronic pain, and reads as follows. That's not very long. Any chronic or debilitating disease or medical condition for which an opioid is currently or could be prescribed by a physician based on generally accepted standards of care, subject, however, to the requirements of section 44, 53, 2080, A3, H, I, and 2, I, double I, as to a physician's attestation regarding objective proof of the etiology of the patient's pain or regarding the patient having been diagnosed with a specific medical condition or disease that causes the patient severe pain. So you can't just walk in and say, I got pain in my knee. A physician has to make, to, to put down in writing and attest that that pain is tied to objective proof 
of the etiology of the patient's pain or regarding the patient having been diagnosed with a specific medical condition or disease that causes that pain. So you can't just walk in and say, I've got pain. Yeah, because let's just say, doctor, I have tripped and fallen on the playground and chasing after my child, and it, my knee has just bothered me ever since then. Okay, now you've got something you can tie it to. And then you even have in here that fibromyalgia is something that they can tie chronic pain to. That in and of itself is a nebulous, nebulous diagnosis. So I guess my concern, and I'll, I'll sit down so you can continue, is that these doctors are going to be supposedly prescribing marijuana for basically anything, because they can prescribe opioids for basically anything. We know that. That's why we're in a lawsuit. But, 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 they, but they can't, Senator. There's 13 specific conditions that, is, that a physician, and I might as well go through this whole physician thing now, because it's been brought up a couple times. I'm going to let you go ahead and go okay. through it. I want to I thank you, though, for, for yielding yes, to me. Yes, ma'am. All right. So Section 44-53-2080 talks about the written certification form that a physician needs to fill out in order to authorize a patient to access cannabis as medicine. And I'm just going to go through the things that they have to attest to in writing. Looking at paragraph 3A and then following down from there. First, that the physician and patient have a bona fide physician-patient relationship as a prerequisite to any certification. And bona fide physician-patient relationship is a defined term which is in person, um, not, a, not, not, not a drive by, it's got to be an actual uh, meeting in which a physician makes a diagnosis, physical, uh, pr in, in the presence of the patient, physical presence. B, that the physician has consulted the prescription drug monitoring program to review the patient's controlled substance prescription history and has documented such con consultation in the patient's medical record. C, that the physician has conducted an in person evalu evaluation and collected relevant clinical history commensurate with the presentation of the patient prior to issuing a written certification. At a minimum, that evaluation must include the patient's history of, mental, uh, of, of present illness, social history, past medical and surgical history, alcohol and substance abuse history, family history with an emphasis on addiction, mental illness, or psychotic disorders, physical exam, and documentation of therapies with inadequate response. And let me start with that last that last. Sen Senator from Charleston, what, what yeah. purpose? Point of order? Point of order, yes, sir. I State am, your point. I, I, it's very difficult for me to follow along when we're going paragraphs and things of that nature and you're reading. And there are several sections in the bill where I recognize a lot of what you're reading, um, but is it possible for us to either go by page numbers or get something on the yeah. Um, on the screen, or just we need to be able to stay together and understand what yeah. you're reading. Th this one's, uh, Senator Charleston, is section 44-53-2080. I don't know what page uh, I, that uh, is on the screen. I, I don't have a, um, there's not a point from that standpoint, but certainly made, made him um, well, he's Happy. reading. If he's gonna, he shouldn't be reading, I don't suppose, and, and I, but I don't want to harm him. Right. I just want to be, be able, able to, to follow, follow along. along. I understand. So the Senate's so notified. Senator from Darling, what purpose? Pardon me, is the point of order raised or not raised? I ruled that that uh, that she just made the point that she could not read, so I, I acknowledge that. She's just making a point, but not a point of order. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Senator from Buford, if there's a way. Continuing on with with my characterization of 44-53-2080, uh, um, mindful of the fact that. Okay, I, I won't read it verbatim, but that's what I'm referring to, that, that section. Um, another requirement that, that has got to be in that written certification by the physician is that the patient has one of those de debilitating medical conditions, that the treatment of that condition um, or one or more of the symptoms of the debilitating medical condition falls within the physician's area of practice, identifying the patient's condition and that the symptoms or side effects or condition or, or its treatment could benefit from a certification for the medical use of cannabis. Next, importantly, and, and these are all things, this, this is elaborate because I want that physician-patient relationship to be exalted and I want the physician to have to do specific things and put them in writing. That makes our bill a lot different from another, a lot of other bills, a lot of other laws. This is important coming up and continuing the certification requirements, that the physician has developed a written treatment plan that includes 
A review of other measures attempted to ease the suffering caused by debilitating medical condition that do not involve cannabis products for medical use. So we're, we're talking about authorizations by a physician in cases where traditional therapeutics haven't worked, okay? That's a condition to being authorized to have cannabis. There's got to be a, phys a physician's attestation that those conventional medications have not helped the suffering. Also, this written treatment plan has to include advice about other options for managing the debilitating medical condition. Has to also provide advice about the potential risks on the use of medical cannabis products, which include the potential exacerbation of psychotic disorders. Because it is the case in some individuals, 1% is, is, is the data that, that I have here, in some individuals, cannabis can be not good at all. It can, and, and, and this book here by Alex Burrison, Tell Your Children, that the Palmetto Family Council mailed out throughout the state, I guess, focuses on those cases where a patient has responded negatively and it has fed into schizophrenia. But, but the fact that, that, that cannabis as medicine may interact with patients in a certain way a, minor, a very small minority of patients is not a reason to throw the thing out completely. I mean, there, there's always going to be somebody who is going to respond negatively to any sort of prescription drug or any kind of medicine. There's going to be those outliers. But, but to take those instances and then bootstrap into a reason why we shouldn't allow it at all doesn't make any sense. I mean, if that were the test, we'd have no medications that could be prescribed because there's always going to be somebody out there that has a negative reaction. You can't let that minor exception be the rule. And, and, but anyway, in recognition of that fact, that there are cases that are documented in this, in this book, I, I would say a little bit sensationally for my taste, but they're documented, that's why I call this the tell your children section, okay? That's why there is this specific requirement that a physician have a written treatment plan that includes discussing and looking into whether or not there are psychiatric disorders or adverse cognitive effects that could result from it. I mean, so, so this is a very, very high bar. And it goes, it goes on and on. And, but I, and, and I'll, to the Charles, Senator from Charleston's point, I'll just commend your attention to section 44-53-2080 in terms of establishing that extraordinarily high bar um, to qualify to get cannabis. It didn't like other states. It didn't like Arizona, it's not like California. It's, it's our law. And, and, and quite frankly, it's a very, it's going to be difficult for a patient to get access to cannabis under this law. Because you have to have a physician making a diagnosis within his or her field of expertise, going through all these, this due diligence list, and then certifying that this patient has a qualifying condition that could benefit from cannabis and that therapeutics or other methods have not worked. Very, very high. And Higher than I would like, quite frankly, because I think it's going to bar a lot of access to medicine. But I realize there is a value and a virtue to going slow, to being measured, to making certain about things, um, especially when we're trying something new. So I've made my peace with that. But, and, and I don't know how much you want me to go into detail in, in regard to, I guess, just to make my record. Each of the conditions, starting with cancer, um, there is a peer-reviewed um, medical study that's dated March 17, 2016. Conclusion, cannabis is known for its antiemetic properties, which makes it an appealing treatment. Um, it is, it is uh, THC um, can treat nausea uh, via emetic reflex pathways by acting as receptors located in the nucleus tractus Celerity at the level of the area post -trema. I mean, I could never go to med school. This is just, just words that I just have never seen. Bottom line is it helps with the nausea, it helps with the vomiting, it helps with the pain, and it helps stimulate appetite. And, and I know this firsthand because my friend and, and our colleague across the hall's brother, Bill Horst brother, died of cancer. And in the days before he died, and this is why Bill sponsored the bill over in the house, Marijuana was the only thing that allowed him to maintain any sort of semblance of living. 
in terms of appetite, in terms of, 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 of pain, in terms of, of just quality of life. And, and so cancer, that's why cancer is one of the listed qualifying um, conditions. Um, PTSD. Um, well, first I'll talk about uh, muscle spasticity and pain. Um, a study done and in, in, uh, released in April 9, 2018, um, done by um, doctors Guying, G-Y-A-N-G, Highland, Sankoff, and Goodman, um, who looked at uh, individuals or patients who had multiple sclerosis. And the finding was the majority of subjects, 77%, found medical marijuana helpful in managing symptoms, primarily spasticity and pain, and reported no side effects. More than half, 70%, felt their quality of life improved with medical marijuana, and, patients, and some patients reduced other symptomatic medications. Um, neurology, disorder, neurology diseases. Um, study that was done, a peer-reviewed study, um, April 2014. Um, efficacy and safety of medical marijuana in neurological disorders. Um, the following, and this is the conclusion, um, the following were studied in patients with MS. Spasticity, oral cannabis extract is effective. Uh, Nabix, Nabix Smoles and THC is effective for reducing, for reducing pain-centered measures. Um, they're effective in uh, reducing pain or painful spasms. Um, and, and, and just details how the cannabinoids interact with the body to address those underlying neurological um, difficulties and problems. Um, NIH, National Institute of Health, U.S. National Library of Medicine, published um, a scientific abstract on February 3, 2017, about Alzheimer's that I shared with the Center from Lexington just a moment ago. Um, there's another study in regard to Alzheimer's that was in December of 2019, um, on Hollis-Eisner's uh, patients, and the conclusion was uh, CBD in cannabis uh, is useful to treat and prevent um, Alzheimer's because cannabis components could suppress the main causal factors of, an of Alzheimer's disease. Um, again, I mean, I've just pulled out a, a, a few um, of the studies. There are more. Um, happy, I have, I have a box in my office of other studies if you want to see further information in that regard. In regard to epilepsy, I mean, that, that's, that's beyond, um, I guess, debate at this point in time. Um, the, the problem is that although CBD is allowed, what we passed in 2014 basically allows cannabis oil that's, that's got CBD and only trace amounts of THC. It doesn't allow more than 0.9 percent. In many instances with epilepsy, you need that combination of CBD and THC to get the therapeutic benefit to the, to the patient. And, and, and again, uh, 500 young patients um, were studied. Um, this, is, uh, this was in Jerusalem, as in Israel. They looked at 500 young patients um, that had epilepsy, and they found, quote, marked improvement in seizure rates for children suffering from uncontrolled epilepsy. Um, PTSD. Um, and, and I know some of you had the opportunity to visit with, um, with Gary Hess, um, who's a Marine Corps veteran um, who had unbelievable trauma um, while defending our country and came back home with PTSD and on several occasions contemplated suicide. And they loaded him up with pharmaceuticals. They essentially, you know, rendered and took away his quality of life completely. And then he found out that marijuana provided that relief. And so he's made it his mission to go around to other states. On his own dime, he's here trying to have you guys understand his story. I mean, and, and almost like if, if he could be on the screen like Margaret Richardson was, if he can benefit from this, isn't it incumbent upon us to find out a way to get it to him? I mean, surely we can do that. I mean, if we've got something we know, it's beyond doubt that it helps with PTSD. We got to get it to our veterans. The veterans, want, the veterans, have, you know, have asked for this. I mean, they're they're um, veterans of foreign wars, VFW. Um, they did a study um, published, you know, just a few months ago, September 21, 2021. 
um, for veterans diagnosed with PTSD. Um, this is a FDA regulated study, by the way. It yielded favorable results. It showed that, that they got relief. Um, 150 person study, and this was the finding. The study found that cannabis users reported a greater decrease in the severity of their PTSD symptoms. They were also 2.5 times as likely to no longer meet the diagnostic criteria for PTSD as those who do not use cannabis. We're talking about something that can help our veterans. I mean, and, and just a few statistics here for South Carolina. Did you know that since 9-11, 2001, just over 7,000 U.S. service members have lost their lives in combat, but during that same period, 120,000 veterans have lost their lives to suicide. 120,000 veterans committed suicide since, since September 11. Twice the number of Americans killed in Vietnam. Did you know that South Carolina has the largest population of veterans per capita than any other state in the nation? Did you know that veterans make up 10% of South Carolina's adult population? Did you know that a veteran in South Carolina takes their life by suicide every three days? Every three days. In that press conference out there, Republican Party, come out of family council and SLED, you didn't see any veterans out there. You didn't see any veterans out there. The veterans out there are the ones saying, empower us. Let the doctors give us what they think is in our best interest. Why are you, why are you not authorizing this? Why are you looking back at a 1971 law that classifies cannabis as a Schedule I drug along with heroin? And we know why that is. The history is clear. President Nixon wanted to stick it to the protesters. He ran that thing through. Nixon's own medical advisory team said, do not do this. Medical, marijuana does have medical value, but he did it anyway. He got this thing passed anyway. And we are paying obeisance to a law passed in 71 for that reason, and that's why we're not giving veterans medicine they need? That's ridiculous. And, but, and again, and I agree with Senator Johnson, just because 36 states have done it, look, doesn't mean we have to do it. But it is indicative that it works. You wouldn't have 36 states passing medical cannabis laws unless it worked. You wouldn't have them passing those laws if the federal law prohibited them from doing it, OK? It doesn't prohibit them from doing it. And just to make clear, the express language of the CSA that says we don't preempt, but just to make extra certain, Congress says every year to the Department of Justice, you can't use any of this money to challenge states that have passed medical cannabis laws. And yet, that's a reason we shouldn't do it? That's not a reason. It's not, it's not, it's not a very good reason. Um, in regard to opioids, and... We, we, we know about the opioid crisis, but I don't know if you know about these studies. This is a study that was published in the Journal of American Medicine in 2018, um, entitled Association Between U.S. State Medical Cannabis Laws and Opioid Prescribing in the Medicare Part D Population. Um, and what they studied was the association between U.S. State implementation of medical cannabis laws and opioid prescribing. Conclusion, opioid-related mortality increased by 15.6% from 2014 to 2015 and increased almost 320% between 2000 and 2015. But in medical cannabis states, there was a decrease from, uh, of, of 2.1 million daily doses of opioids under Medicare Part D as a re response to states that have medical cannabis laws. You, you, you saw that decrease in, in numbers of uh, prescribed opioids. Um, another study um, published in the Journal of American Medicine um, studied three states that had medical cannabis laws um, and contrasted them with, with states that did not have medical cannabis laws. Conclusion. 
States with medical cannabis laws had a 24.8% lower mean annual opioid overdose mortality rate compared with states without medical cannabis laws. This is looking at data over an 11-year period, specifically contrasting states that have medical cannabis laws, a 24.8% less annual opioid overdose. If we want to do something about opioid abuse rather than just talk about it, Let's provide a substitute for opioids that is nowhere near as, as the side effects, nowhere, nowhere near as damaging. You're not going to overdose on marijuana, okay? You are going to overdose on opioids, and you build up tolerance to the opioids. But cannabis works differently. Opiates, opioids address the pain. Medical cannabis the cannabinoids interacts with your body's endocannabinoidal system and gets to the underlying cause of that pain, okay? There's a difference between treating symptoms and addressing causes. Why would we not, faced with that clear information, I've got more studies that, that'll show the same correlation, why would we not make this available? Doctors want to, do, doctors want to help their patients. Senator, uh, Senator from Orangeburg, Senator Stevens. I apologize, I didn't know the Senator was there. Would the what, Senator what, yield what for a couple of friendly ask? questions? Sure, Senator Yields. Senator Yields. Senator, uh, do you know that the last 16 days have been some very trying times for me? I thought, Senator, that I know quite a bit, but I find out that you know more. And I, I thank you for your work on, on the certificate of need, and I'm thanking you now on your work uh, with medical uh, marijuana. I took it upon myself, Senator, you know, to, to go at back and to, to read and to, to, to follow uh, the benefits of cannabis, medical marijuana. And Senator, as I, as I went and I read, it was amazing that all of these different conditions, some of the conditions that you just spoke about, uh, there was different screens, multiple screens of, of cannabis out there that is, is, is good for, uh, Senator, do you know depression, anxiety, uh, uh, what else uh, I got, uh, arthritis, arthritis. Senator, do you know that with this list of pains and agonizing events that have crippled our generation of, 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 of people, that we have something, Senator, that we have the power to help them, them being those individuals who are, are crippled with pain, Senator, to make their life more easy. You make a great point, um, Senator, when you talk about um, different strains um, addressing different conditions. And, and it's important you know, in, in understanding this, um, there are two main chemical derivatives of cannabis. You've got CBD and THC. Okay, THC is the derivative that has psychoactive components. Um, and the ratio of THC, THC to CBD may have to be adjusted to address a certain person's condition because everybody, everybody has an endocannabinoidal system, okay? And a lot of these, these conditions, these qualifying conditions, are a result of their endocannabinoidal system being out of whack or being defective. Cannabis interacts with your body in a way to remediate that, that, that imbalance, that deficiency. And, and that's why, you know, what this bill requires, and, and one of the things it requires is independent lab testing to make sure that it's pure, no adulterants, nothing dangerous for, for patients. But also, importantly, what it does is it labels each of the products and provides there what the ratio of THC to CBD is so that you can know, you can figure out which one is interacting with you in a way that provides relief. Because, as you say, what might work for you in addressing a condition you have, I may have the same condition, but I might need a different ratio because my endocannabinoidal system is different than yours. And do you know, Senator, in, in that, same, that same information that I, that I read, that it, it simply says that it comes down to genetics 
and the chemical makeup of one's body. Absolutely. Of how effective or uh, will actually medical marijuana work. And the reason, and it's a great point, because most pharmaceuticals, okay, address symptoms of, of illnesses or problems or diseases. What's different about cannabis and, the way, and, and cannabis as medicine is it interacts with your body in a way to address the underlying causes of those conditions. It's, it's just a different approach. And, and that's why you're seeing in many instances, and again, I want to emphasize, before a patient can access cannabis, they've got to be a written certification by a physician saying, these other, these other things haven't worked. Okay, they haven't provided the relief. I mean, it's almost like our right to try legislation, right? Our right to try legislation says that if, if you tried everything else, if you tried all these pharmaceuticals and none of them providing the relief, then you can have these non-FDA things. I'm just talking, why can't we do that same thing here? If, if there are certain conditions which the evidence shows can, can be treated with medical cannabis, and if a physician then says, okay, we've gone through and done a diagnosis, we've made a finding that you have this condition that qualifies, we also made a finding that the, the pharmaceuticals or other medicines you've been given haven't worked. Why wouldn't we give them access to that? I mean, I just, I mean, to me, to me, to me, it's just that doctor-patient relationship. And I heard a lot about that during the COVID debate with people being upset about government telling physicians what they can do for their patients. But some of those same individuals are ones that have concerns about this bill now. And, and I, 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 don't, I don't get that disconnect. But do you Senator, do, do you believe that it's because of a lack of knowledge? Uh, and I know you've been at this for a number of years now, but as I said, you know, the, the last couple of days have really been uh, good for me in my going back and, 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 and looking at and, and researching and seeing exactly uh, what is cannabis all about. And, you know, once again, going back to some of those illnesses that that cannabis helps, and, and, and just to, to, to mention depression and the different screens of, of um, cannabis that will actually help with this. Uh, you know, you, you, you talk about lemon haze, uh, 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 Jack Hera. It, it, there's so many different names to the, the, the different screens of cannabis that is directly distributed, I mean, not distributed, but uh, attributed to what effect that person would get. And yes, the, the ratio between the uh, TCH and uh, what is its psychotic effect or, or the uh, neural effects from the use of, of CBD, this is where, Senator, do you know, I think that the, the, uh, the doctors or the physicians comes in and to best describe what is best for the, uh, for the patient. So I'm, 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 going to, I'm going to sit down, but Senator, I want you to continue to educate us on this and to educate the citizens of South Carolina because I, I think it's time now that we do something that is constructive for the citizenry. And as I said, and I will say again, I am, Senator, as you know, in favor of this bill, and I will support it, and I will go out, and I will do whatever I have to do, Senator, to make sure that South Carolina is given an opportunity, citizens is given an opportunity to be able to enjoy Joy life from the therapeutic results of cannabis. Thank you. Looks like this. Um, Senator, um, your questions in regard to what do South Carolinians want? You a, a, a poll that was done a few weeks ago, um, because I want you to know where South Carolinians are on this. I mean, I, I don't offer the poll um, for political purposes. I offer the poll to show you 
where the people of South Carolina are on this issue. And, and in having the poll done, um, I, I was sensitive to arguments that my friends with the, the Palmetto Family Council have made that the polls have been misleading in, in the past. And for instance, there was a July 2021 poll that was done that asked this question, do you support or oppose allowing patients in South Carolina who suffer from serious medical conditions to use medical marijuana if their doctors recommend it? Well, I think, I think that's, that's a fair question. Um, the answer is 72% say yes, 15% oppose, 13% no opinion. But I stripped it down and said, I want you to put the question in a very bald fashion and just simply ask this. Do you support or oppose legalizing medical marijuana in South Carolina? Court would stand at ease momentarily if they get the right. Well, let's, right. while we're on that one, let's stop there real quick. So, Senator from Buford. Senator, to go to your death, uh, you granted unanimous consent uh, to, to uh, explain, explain that. Okay, so asking just that basic baseline question, do you support or oppose legalizing medical marijuana in South Carolina? 54% support, 32 oppose, 14 no opinion. Now that's in terms of favorability for medical cannabis, that's not as as strong as the earlier question that, that was asked, right? But I wanted to go ahead and get a, a good baseline. Okay, next question, please. So then we did three pushes. We did three negative pushes and three positive pushes. Would you be more or less likely to vote if you knew a Palmetto Family Council opposes? 28% said more likely to oppose, 31% said less likely. SLED and most sheriffs oppose. 28% said they'd be more likely, 27% um, would be less likely. That medical cannabis might lead to recreational. 33% said, well, you can see, uh, 33 to 32. Then you go to the three positive pushes. If it could reduce opioid use, 63% then said, when informed of that, they're more likely. That it could be an effective treatment for veterans, 72% said they'd be more likely. An effective for cancer patients and MS, 75% more likely. So you can see with the three positive pushes and the three negative pushes, you can see what moves people until finally, next screen please, this is the informed ballot, okay? After asking those three negative pushes and three positive pushes, 67% support, 22% oppose. So my point, is this. Senator for Buford. This is where the people of South Carolina are on this. And it's not just this poll, it's other polls that have been done showing support in the 70 to 75% range. S there is a disconnect up here between what we're doing and what people want. I'll, I'll yield to my friend from Greenville. S Senator from Greenville, Senator Corbin, what purpose do you rise? Um, if Senator would yield, I'll be very for, brief. For, for a question? Um, yes, yeah, for, for a question. question. Senator yields for um, a question. When I was reading it earlier, it looked like that the respondents was 146. Was that the, all the respondents you had was 146 respondents? Let me look at the... Uh, or did I miss that? Be the second slide. Data presented as a summary of 300 registered voters. 154 reached via landline, 146 reached via cell phone. Okay, so it was a total respondents of 300, 300. people? Right. Okay, thank right. you. Um, and, and I guess my point to, when I was talking to Seth from Orangeburg was... Um, I've tried to come up with a bill that, that reflects what South Carolinians want. And, and, and what I'm convinced that they want after looking at these polls is they want to empower doctors because it can be a therapeutic benefit, but they do not want this to be a slippery slope um, or a sham law where everybody can walk in and get cannabis. 
That's not what this bill is. This bill is extraordinarily restrictive and tight and cautious and conservative for that reason. Now, I talked a little bit about the things that were in the recent GOP email that got sent out under sheriff's names. And the very first thing they talk about is illegal. Well, yeah, it is illegal right now in South Carolina. We're talking about making it legal. Um, and, and there's nothing, nothing that prevents us from doing so, like 36 other states have done or that Mississippi is about to do. The second thing they say is medicine is, marijuana is not medicine. Medicine is based on legitimate research and science, not politics and not feelings. I mean, I'm going through, and I'll continue to go through, the scientific abstracts and the studies that show that it is therapeutic. Um, perhaps most notably, in 2017, the National Academy of Sciences, they looked at 10,000 scientific abstracts, medical abstracts, and found that there is conclusive proof, the highest degree of proof, not substantial, not somewhat, conclusive proof that cannabis can be efficacious as medicine. Okay? That's, that's not, what did they call it again? That's not politics and not feelings. That's, that's based on legitimate research and science. I mean, what they're throwing out there to you is based on emotion and, and, and politics. Impaired driving will only be further exacerbated if medical marijuana is legalized. Okay, I mentioned that earlier. I want to give you some specifics on that. Um, a study that was published um, on... March 20, 2014, in the American College of Medical Tech Tox Toxicology. Um, get to the findings. All right, this, <laughs> interestingly, Drivers who use marijuana recreationally drive slower, have increased following distances, and overestimate their degree of intoxication. Conversely, alcohol intoxicated vehicle operators drive faster, have shorter following distance, and underestimate their degree of intoxication. Okay, well, that was a provocative statement. I mean, and, and, and since, you know, they are largely, in many instances, substitute um, uh, products, alcohol and cannabis, that gives rise to the reason why you see a drop in these fatalities. And so I looked at the footnote there, and they footnoted a study that was done by the Department of Transportation, um, Federal Depart U.S. Department of Transportation, called Marijuana and Actual Driving Performance. And this is back in 1993 that the DOT did this. And... This is fascinating to me. Um, well, um, Caswell, as uh, uh, an economist, in 1979, was the first who included a subsidiary task to simulate demands for monitoring the environment. Thirteen males were tested in three treatment sessions, receiving alcohol and marijuana treatments twice in each session, and drove for 35 minutes after each treatment. Treatments included alcohol plus placebo marijuana, placebo alcohol plus marijuana, double placebo, and placebo alcohol and marijuana. Alcohol and marijuana combined, and alcohol and marijuana with a higher dosage. Subjects tasks included overtaking, driving in straight sections through a hairpin bend and through narrow gaps while responding to road signals, traffic signals, and auditory signals in the subsidiary task. The finding was Drivers under the influence of marijuana compensated for what they felt were the adverse effects of the drug by maintaining control, effort, and decreasing speed to reduce the required rate of information processing. Alcohol, in contrast, produced more risky behavior. Th that's why you're seeing these studies that traffic fatalities and incidences of impaired driving in the aggregate have fallen, not increased, in states that have medical cannabis laws. And I'm not arguing, Senator Johnson, that you, you can't be under the influence of marijuana and be in an accident, but I'm talking about in the aggregate, when you're comparing states that have medical cannabis laws, they don't, as the Republican Party said in that email, they don't increase, they decrease. 
I mean, it's, it's just a direct falsehood that they're putting out there. And, and I, it, you know, it, 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 well, it doesn't pain me to say it. I think it's, you know, I think it's wrong. Um, more studies in that regard. Not just one, another one. Marijuana decriminalization, marijuana, uh, medical marijuana laws, and fatal car crashes in U.S. cities between 2010 and 2017. Um, a study that was published in the, um, um, in the AGPH. I'm not figuring out what that acronym stands for right now. I think it's American Journal of something. Um, Thirteen percent, I'm sorry, we found that medical marijuana laws were associated with fewer crashes, fatal crashes for both males and females. Um, and then it references that DOT study as well that, that showed the same thing. Another study that shows the same correlation between medical cannabis laws and a decrease in those impaired driving um, fatalities is using that same one that was in the AGPH uh, study that was in February 2017. Using population-based data from 1985 to 2014, we found that first, states that enacted medical marijuana laws during that study period had lower fatality rates compared with states without medical marijuana laws. Second, on average, traffic fatalities further decreased in states post-ML MML, medical marijuana laws with both immediate um, declines over time and that we found on average that MML states, medical marijuana law states, had lower traffic fatality rates than non-MML states. And that it is possible that this is related to lower levels of alcohol impaired driving behavior in MML states. Again, the whole substitute goods argument. Um, another study, I mean, because that was published in, um, published on uh, December 3rd, 2009. Uh, cannabis as a substitute for alcohol and other drugs. Uh, the conclusion as to why you're saw, seeing this decrease in these accident rates in MML states, medical marijuana law states, um, is because patients have been engaging in substitution by using cannabis as an alternative to alcohol prescription and illicit drugs. Um, again, I'm not arguing in favor of... of, of, of coming under the influence of marijuana and going out and driving. What I'm saying is to state that there's going to be an increase in fatalities or impaired driving if we pass this law is not borne out by the evidence in states that have passed those laws. And in fact, they've gone down. They've gone down in those states. Senator from Greenville, Senator Lott, what purpose do you rise? Question. Senator Yields. Senator Yields. Senator, uh, and what I'm going to ask is, I'm not trying to be cute, but you're presenting data there that says accidents and, and driving carelessly, whatever, recklessly is coming down with opioid, opioid use. Why then do you put in the bill that they can't be driving a car? Not opioid use. Not opioid uh, excuse me. I, I misspoke. Yeah. Cannabis. Um, I'm not arguing that it's a good idea to drive while under the influence of marijuana. What I'm saying is, I'm, I'm objecting to the statement that was put out there that if you pass medical marijuana laws, you're going to see traffic impaired, impaired drivers being in accidents more often. What I'm saying is, the evidence shows the reverse. So in other words, I'm not encouraging people to get high or, or, or take marijuana and drive a car. What I'm saying is, the argument that they're advancing out there, without citing any studies, that this is going to further increase impaired driving incidents is not borne out by the five or six studies that I have here that have looked at precisely that question. First of all, let me, let me tell you, I appreciate you calling me to further inform me about this issue, and I, I do appreciate this. I know you're passionate about it. I happen to disagree with you in so many instances here, but doesn't in many cases, the users of alcohol and marijuana users, doesn't that quite often co concur at the same place? I'm speaking, you mentioned of 70s or whatever you mentioned yeah. earlier, and I thought about Woodstock yeah. uh, and what went on there. Um, is it kind of in the same party I think, theme? 
I, Would I be accurate? I mean, certainly, certainly, you know, I'm not going to say that there are instances of people drinking beers or, right. or alcohol and also, you know, smoking marijuana or, or, or taking marijuana. Clear, clearly, they do. But, but what, I'm, what I'm suggesting is, and what I'm saying that these studies show, is that to a considerable degree, alcohol and marijuana are substitute goods. And that if you legalize medical cannabis and give patients access to medical cannabis, at the margins, there's going to be less alcohol, and, and the statistics bear that out. So, and I think, you know, it, when you ask your question, well, why, why is that the case, this whole theory of substitution of goods, I mean, um, but you're right, it can be complimentary. There, there are people, plenty of people that, that would drink beer and get high and, and smoke dope, too. I mean, I, I get that. But on the whole and in the aggregate, that substitution effect that I'm talking about not only does it not only have driver-impaired instances not gone up like this email says they will, they've gone down materially. And that's based on studies done by the Department of Transportation and others that, that I have here. And I, I, again, I'm not going to belabor this point too much, but, but I, I want to make clear that I'm not cherry-picking one study. I'm giving you five or six studies that have looked over a decade of time and compared fatality rates post and, and, and a, I mean before and after ML laws, ML, MML laws, and there's a decrease. And, and I think, you know, I want to speak from my own experience that you tend to get a little paranoid when you're high, and you, you tend to, you know, slow down a little bit more when you're going to crystals or whatever. You, 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 mean, that's, you just do. And, you know, and, and, and if you drink, I mean, the, the thing is that, you know, again, the studies are that you, you are less inhibited and that you, you're more aggressive. And, and so it stands to reason to me that if there's substitute goods in that way, that's a reason for that decline. Well, I think, did you know, the, one of the questions I asked you earlier in a previous conversation was uh, the combination of, of, of uh, cannabis or marijuana and, and alcohol someone who drinks a beer and gets in a car, and, and your response was, well, both are illegal, and that's true, but if you observe the beer cans on the country roads out there, you know they do it anyway. I mean, they just, they are. They're going to drink and drive. Uh, so do we know the effect of that? I, th I think it'd be bad. I, th I think if you're, if you're under the influence of alcohol and marijuana and driving a car, that's a bad idea. I, again, I'm not making the argument that, that it's safe and people ought to get out there under the influence of marijuana and drive a car. I'm, I'm not saying that. In fact, I'm saying but you should not. I, I do understand that. But, but, what, but what, I, what I'm saying is I'm making the point that the allegation that was put out there by the GOP that driver-impaired incidences are going to go up as a consequence of medical marijuana laws isn't borne out by the evidence. And, and again, we have the advantage here of looking at states that have had medical marijuana laws in place for decades. I mean, we can, these things have been studied. I mean, we're not to guess at it. We know the results. We, we can see it. And not only one study, but in multiple studies, you see a decrease. And so when that's the case, when that's the, the truth, why are they putting out that email saying that if you pass medical marijuana laws, there's going to be more in driver impairment? That's just not true. It, it just, it just, it's not true. Could it, be, could, it, could it be, Senator, that they're impaired, just not as impaired? What's true is that the incidences of impaired driving are less in states that have medical marijuana laws. That's not an argument in favor of, of, of getting on the influence of marijuana and driving. I'm making a statement in regard to, as a matter of public policy, this is the consequence that flows, and it's 180 degrees from what's being put out there. I mean, I mean the, the irony here is you're accusing me okay, of... of um, now you got me thinking about law enforcement getting mad again. I mean, they put this out. They put, they put this out about me. Right. They mailed this to my daughters who aren't even registered to vote. They wanted my daughters to get this. And now, today, the new thing that they're saying I'm in charge of. Sorry, just, it was put out this morning. I am, a, I am trying to establish, quote, an industrial marijuana complex in South Carolina. Capital I industrial, capital M marijuana, capital C complex. I don't even know what that is. What I'm trying to do is let doctors do what they think is in their patient's best interest. What is so radical about that? What's radical is 
that we're letting law enforcement and politicians tell doctors what's in their patient's best interest. That's what's ludicrous. I do understand your point from, from, from that perspective. But when you talk about, when you disregard or when we disregard the medical association, the uh, SLED, the state law enforcement, and, and the sheriff's association who are out there in the public dealing with people who are using opioids, who are using cannabis, who are, are, are whatever they're using out there, they're confronted with it every day. Why should we discount what they have to say? Don't they, shouldn't we know? What, shouldn't we want to know what they have to say? I don't discount what they have to say at all. In fact, I sat down and listened to them, and I put into the bill everything that they suggested. But what they want to do, what they want to do, what they're saying we have to do, is put handcuffs on doctors who want to provide medical marijuana as a treatment, which we know for sure will help the patient. We know. No one disputes it anymore. They used to. When I first started this in 2015, SLED went out there in law enforcement. They all had these little red stickers that said, marijuana is not medicine, okay? They don't have those stickers anymore because there is overwhelming proof now. We've got empirical studies that show it is medicine, okay? So they shift on to something else now. Well, if you somehow allow doctors to authorize use of cannabis, not smoking, because they didn't even want that, for 13 specific medical conditions where a doctor has to go through a litany of things before he, can, he or she can authorize it, that if we do that, we're going to have more traffic fatalities? Based on what? On nothing. And in fact, it's the other, it's the other is true. The data shows that they go down. I mean, this misinformation is just ludicrous. Absolutely ludicrous. Well, did you know I would agree there's a lot of misinformation out there, perhaps on both sides? And, what, what and, I, I mean, tell me what I have said that, that you believe is not true, and I'll try to, I'll try to go ahead and rebut it. I, uh, I'm not saying you said anything other than you, you are speculating on some surveys and, and what, and, and I, I understand why you're upset if, if you were targeted. I, I would be too. I understand that. So. But, I, but I guess I would say I'm not speculating. I'm, I'm looking at what these exhaustive studies over a, a decade of time, peer-reviewed, double-blind, I'm not speculating, I'm telling you what they show. And, and, and if we're going to talk about predictive, we're, we're trying to be predictive here. We're trying, to, we're trying to anticipate what are the consequences of this going to be. I don't know how else to do it except to look to what the experience has been in the states that have, that have legalized medical marijuana. Because we have real-world experience with what's happened there. Has there been an increase in teen use? No, I'll get to that in a moment. There's been no increase in, 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 in uh, marijuana use by teens as a result of medical marijuana laws. I mean, that's shown in study after study as well. I mean, just, just these things that they're throwing out there, there's no support for it. And it's, so that's what I'm responding to. Okay, first, you know, I'm having a pot party and it gets sent to my daughters and, I, and whatever, that's funny, that's fine. Now I'm it's in charge funny. of an industrial marijuana complex. I'm, I'm a don of some sort. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know. Tell, tell me this, if you will. Um, and you mentioned something about corporate, I forgot what you said exactly, but, but we have increasing number of lobbyists out there lobbying uh, for this issue right now. Uh, how much does it cost to set up a, a uh, distribution, I mean, a, a, a dispensary? Got any idea? Um, the capital costs of, 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 of building um, a grow facility or a processing facility or a dispensary? I, I, I'd be speculating. I, I don't know. I mean, you're just thinking of square foot costs. Um, I don't know. You got, and you got equipment, and you've got to hire, you know, um, qualified personnel. I mean, you've got all sorts of monitoring. And that's another thing about this bill. One of the things that we did is I went around and looked at these 36 states that have legalized medical cannabis, and I found out which ones had the best security, which ones had the best tracking, which ones had the best real-time so we built, we put in here a 24-7 seed to sale tracking where you know where the product is at all times, in real time. SLED or DHEC can go unannounced onto premises at any time. I mean, I, I built into this everything they wanted in terms of, 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 of monitoring, in terms of security, in terms of making sure there wasn't diversion, in, in terms of, you know, you can't smoke it. I mean, 
I gave and gave and gave and gave to the point where they won't engage with me anymore. Um, and they'll just go ahead and throw out blatant falsehoods instead. That's how they're engaging now. Well, I, I, I said I could apologize for, for somebody else's actions, but that's their actions on that. Uh, my point in asking that question, it's not going to be a small entity that's going to open up a dispensary. Is that correct? Well, you, you would think that would be correct. There's because it's in, yeah in, in in the in the bill um, there's a, a limited universe of um, growers processors and dispensers and it's it's that way for an important reason we're starting something new and I didn't want there to be like some states just have it wide open and you know any number of people can be growers or processors or dispensers this bill constricts that universe because. I want DHEC and SLED to be able to monitor that behavior. I want, I, want, I want them to become familiar, and I don't want to overwhelm them with the number of participants out there with something that's brand new. It, so, that is not limited in the bill, right? It is in the bill, limited yeah. in the bill. How many? Um, let me pull up that up. I missed that somehow. Yeah, it's, um, I'll give you the section, Senator. Give me a moment. Okay, it's uh, section 44-53-2390, and they're limited as follows. Um, 15 cultivation center licenses, that's the growers. 30 processing facility licenses. Four transporter licenses, and I haven't talked about that yet, but that's how you get product from a grow to a processor to a dispenser. Um, and then one dispensary for every 20 pharmacies in the state and five independent testing laboratory licenses. So, so those are the universe of applicants. And then the bill sets forth the criteria that they have to submit to DHEC. You know, what experience do they have in the area? How well capitalized are they? Um, what's your business plan look like? Um, and then DHEC is to conduct a review of those applications and to award those limited number of licenses to those applicants that best meet the criteria that we have set forth in the bill. As far as the experience in here, um, do you anticipate most of that coming from out of state, or do we have that experience already in South Carolina? There is in the bill currently a weighting factor that's given if you're from South Carolina. Fr quite frankly, that's something that I thought that maybe on the floor we might want to strengthen that some more to give more of a preference to South Carolinians. Um, you know, that's not going to stop people from coming here. Um, becoming residents and submitting, but maybe if we had more stringent language in regard to how long you've been here, um, the percentage of individuals that you employ that are that have been from here, uh, I, I take your point. I mean, I, I, I you know, uh, on the one hand, the overwhelm, overriding objective of this bill is to get medicine in the hands of people who need it, but a secondary consideration or another consideration is the economic well-being of South Carolinians as opposed to somebody from out of state. So I, I understand that issue, and I'm willing to work on that. One of the things that I have read here, and you get a lot of information, and I try to vet it, I try to verify the source, et cetera, uh, is say that in other states where medical marijuana has come into play, uh, the next step is open use of it. Is, what is your response to that? Do you agree with that or disagree? Yeah, no, I, well, I disagree. I think it depends on, on your state. Um, and, and, and generally, um, a state is going to reflect or its policies are going to reflect what their citizens want, um, which is why you have 36 different types of medical cannabis laws with different emphasis on, on things. Um, you know, so, so while in California there was a progression from medical cannabis to a point now where you can just go out there and grow your own, we're, South, we're in South Carolina, and it's like anything else. I mean, if you, don't have, if you don't have the support of the people of South Carolina, it's not going to happen in these chambers. And, and so I guess that would be my response, is that, is that every legislature is going to be reflective of what their citizens want. South Carolinians don't want 
to be like California or Colorado. They, I think they want this. I mean, I, I, I think. Now, there are some that would say this goes way, way too far and you're overboard. You're, you're making them jump through all these hoops. But I think that's where South Carolinians are. They want to take a baby step here. They, they, want to, they want to go ahead and take a look and see how does this work and, and, and build in all these safeguards. And maybe over time, it'll turn out that we don't need to have a lot of these safeguards that, that, that all go through. And I want to talk about them. But for right now, I'm comfortable with what I'm presenting to this body because I think it's reflective of what South Carolinians want. Did you know I would agree with you that South Carolinians, I think, do want to take baby steps into it. Mm -hmm. But going back to what I said about the investment here, it's not going away, even if, if we say these baby steps aren't where, where we want to go. I mean, I understand your passion for this. Uh, let, and that, let, me make this let me make this point, too. I mean, it almost seems at mm -hmm. times that I'm talking about introducing marijuana into South Carolina for the first time. Like this is the Garden of Eden and, and, you know, and somehow I'm introducing evil. Marijuana is everywhere and it's being smoked right now. And, and, and um, it's not regulated. You don't know if there's adulterants in it. People are, some people are dying because it's laced with things that, that's very dangerous. What this bill does in a strictly medical context requires it to be tested, requires it to be labeled, requires it to have a physician's approval. I mean, it, it regulates something that right now, I'm telling you, people who get relief from it are doing it now anyway. Most of them are. Margaret Richardson is. I mean, if the alternative to lying away, I mean, waking up screaming in pain with your face feel like there's a Bunsen burner on it and, 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 and puffing on something that makes it go away like that, that's not a hard call to make. It's not. Let me ask you this. You've listed a number of things that cannabis can be used for in treatment, correct? 13. 13 you've, you've mentioned. Which is much less than any other state because I wanted to keep it to those for which I could say, yes, here is empirical medical research and science that says it can help, okay? You I kept it tight. You mentioned fibromyalgia, right? That's a neurological disorder. Um, you familiar with lupus? I know what it is. And systemic lupus? Do you know that it has quite often, systemic lupus has, it, it mimics a lot of things, rheumatoid arthritis, fibromyalgia, uh, pain, and, and, and so forth. Uh, would that be a viable um, a treat? Would, would cannabis be a viable treatment for this? I think, I think it depends on Again, a physician sitting down with that patient, reviewing the medical history, seeing whether or not other medications have helped, you know, counseling them. I think, I, I mean, I can't, I can't put myself in that place, I guess, is, is between that physician and that patient. And, and so I, I don't know in specific examples you're giving me, I, I can't say whether it would be efficacious for a patient or not. I think that's up to that patient physician to decide. And that, that's what really... That's what this is all about, really, from a, from a philosophical level. I've, I've, I've not talked about the philosophy of this, but, but I've always kind of subscribed to the notion that my freedom to swing my arm ends where your nose begins, okay? So that if I do something that affects only myself, then government ought not interfere with me. But if I do something that impacts you, that's a legitimate condition precedent for government to have coercive force against me. All we're talking about here is freeing up a patient in consultation with a physician to do what that patient thinks is in their best interest for one of very tightly defined conditions. And, and, and to me, I don't understand, particularly my party, Republican Party, that's supposed to be for individual liberty, okay? That's, that's, that's supposed to be for the sanctity of the, of the physician-patient relationship. I heard that all the time during the COVID debate and the therapeutics, why they're making this issue something that defines them. And why are they suggesting, I mean, can, can I put up that slide about the funding for, um, for SLED, our law enforcement? Why are they sending out an email saying, if you don't oppose this bill, you're siding with those who wanted to fund the police? Why, why, why are they making that argument? Look, look, it's Senator Martin, this might be a surprise to you. Does that look like a state that doesn't respect law enforcement? Does that look like a state that wants to fund police? They don't. I respect them entirely. They put their lives in harm's way. I do. They're wrong about this. They don't have any special expertise about what's in a patient's best interest. Are they, are they wrong about if, if they determine someone is driving erratically, they smell no alcohol, 
and um, even if the person's got a card. No, that's, that's their job. Look, if you have a card. How do they, how do they determine card. to what degree they, of intoxication they are? I'm, okay. In, in, because and that good, was mentioned. And that's a good point. In regard to um, alcohol, you can do the blood alcohol right. content. In regard to cannabis, because of THC staying in your body for longer, and, and it's, it's, they don't have tests that allow you to measure it that way, in those instances, there's going to be an emphasis on field sobriety tests, where, where, you, where you, you, know, you go through the, the various protocols. Um, be very honest with you, they're working on trying to figure out a way to objectively measure THC content in a body like you can with blood alcohol. They don't have that right now. And, and so they are subject to the same driving under the influence standards. You make a fair point when you talk about there isn't the equivalent of a, of a um, breathalyzer or a BAC test. That, that, is they, a field sobriety test sufficient for charges? I mean, would that stand up? I, I, would, I would defer to, to people who handle DUI cases, but it's my understanding that, um, that a lot of people refuse to take a breathalyzer and that when they are prosecuted for DUIs, they do, the prosecution does rely upon those, those uh, roadside uh, tests. Again, I'm not a DUI lawyer, but um, so yeah, you, you can prosecute somebody based on that. I mean, I think that's one of the first things lawyers counsel drivers to do is don't take the breathalyzer, right? Um, but a lot of them still go to jail anyway. I, uh, I thank you for your work on this. I know you've spent a lot of time on it. I know uh, you're passionate about it, but would you agree that for every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction? The reason for the debate on this floor is, is not only to hear from me, um, but to also hear from others and, and to hear how others could maybe improve the bill. I'm working, uh, at your request, I'm working on comprehensive pharmacy language to maybe put that dispensing power more in the hands of pharmacists. I mean, you, you yeah, sparked would, my interest. Would, that would make me very happy. You sparked you. my interest in that, and I dug into that this weekend and found out about those states that do have pharmacists and got that language, and I want to try to figure out if there's a way we can make that work here. And that, the senator from Charleston, Senator Kansen, said the same thing. And, and I, I, I feel that way, too. I, I want that skill set there. I want that knowledge there, because that's where the rubber hits the road here. Because what you're going to see with, with a patient who's accessing cannabis, once, once that patient gets a written authorization from physician, and the physician's gone through all that due diligence and said, you've got one of these conditions, traditional medicines don't work, cannabis could be beneficial, it's still going to be up to that um, dispenser and that patient to figure out what cannabis product interacts with your body in a way that provides the relief. And, and for some, it's, it's going to differ for everybody because, again, the way cannabis works, your body is an endocannabinoidal system. I mean, you've got cannabinoids throughout your body. And, and a lot of times these symptoms, whether it's neurological disorders or, or any number of things, is because that balance is out of whack or there's something wrong with your endocannabinoidal system. Cannabis can interact with your body to redress that, but sometimes it's going to be through trial and error. You might have a higher ratio of THC and lower to CBD. That might not work. You might have to adjust it around to see what fits. And I think especially because there's that degree of, um, of give and take at that level, integrating the pharmacist into that process, I think is extremely good public policy. And so that brings up another question. Who makes that determination? Is it going to be the doctor who prescribed or recommended, whatever language you want to use there, uh, or is it going to be that pharmacist or someone in the, in the dispensary? Well, I think both, because one of the things the bill requires is that after the authorization is given by the physician, there is a required follow-up um, meeting with the physician. So there's an opportunity, I think, to then, for the patient to share with the physician, okay, these are the ratios I tried, this is what worked, what didn't work. But, but in a large number of the cases, to your point, it's going to occur in that dispensary um, which puts a premium on the knowledge and experience and expertise of that person dispensing. I, that's a fair point. And, and I'm trying to figure out a way to get us there. And because you've said that to me, Senator Kansen has said that to me. Um, and, and look, this is all about getting 45 people to look at this thing and to try to figure out a safe way to help people like Margaret Richardson. That's all I want to do is put something legal and safe in their hands if a doctor thinks they need it. And one of the things, did you know, we, we haven't discussed very much. Now, they send a bill, I know, 
uh, about operating machinery and the employer's uh, liability or lack of liability uh, in, in some cases there. Um, and that's what I meant by other consequences. Yes, it's, it may help some people, and that's true. I understand the passion there and empathize with that. Um, but we also need to look at the other consequences that are that are out there. And, and in some cases, Senator from Greenville, um, and, and, and it's, it's the point that's made in, in this book, is that some individuals are, are prone or suspect, suspect to schizophrenia or, or to, and, and marijuana can exacerbate that, okay? And, and look, because I'm not up here saying marijuana is a panacea and it's going to solve every problem, okay? Because it's not. And I'm not even going to say that you have to be careful about giving it to some people who have shown dispositions toward that kind of behavior because that's a bad idea. Mm -hmm. But what I am saying is that's not a sufficient reason for denying it to the numbers of people that will benefit from it. I mean, what you can do, and, and what I've tried to do in this bill, is, is through that written certification by a physician, they ask these questions, they consider this. Is there a history of, 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 of psychiatric problems and, and, and mental instability? And, and, and in those cases, marijuana is not gonna be therapeutic. But, but, but the fallacy in, this, in that argument is, because that's true of 1% or so of people, you gotta deny it to everybody else. If we applied that same test to every other medication, we'd have no medications, because there's always gonna be somebody that has a negative reaction. And I, I guess that's my point there, is, is that I don't deny the fact that a physician needs to be involved. I don't deny the fact that it's not gonna be for everybody. In fact, I'm gonna say some are going to have a disposition where it's absolutely a horrible idea. But, but, but that's what this whole relationship between a physician and a patient is about, for that physician to guide that. And this is, unlike most every other law, very, very physician-centric. It begins with that physician, and not just with, a, with, a, with an office visit, he cuts you a script. He's got to go through, or she's got to go through, a long list of things outlining you know, what, what sort of conditions need to be met before that can be authorized. It's very, very conservative. And, and quite frankly, it may be that, you know, it's so, it's so conservative that a lot of physicians may not want to do it because they, they may feel like, you know, this, hell, this is a lot of work. But, but I think that there are enough physicians out there that do want to help patients and enough physicians that will carve out a niche in these areas to help patients in that regard that they will be willing to fill out this thing. But it, it's, it's very tight. It's very restricted. Well, did you know, mention that, now that you mentioned that, I, I, I thought about some of the, my physicians that I've gone to, they were even reluctant to recommend certain vitamins. Why, so so why, why would they, you know, endeavor in, in to go this? One of the, one of the things that, that, I've, that I found in, in, in looking into this is among physicians, there is a, 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 a greater willingness to kind of embrace cannabis as a medicinal uh, approach among younger physicians. Because older physicians, when they went to medical school, um, cannabis was not included as, as part of their curriculum. We, we, you do now have in, in medical schools, and MUSC is a leader in this regard. I, I participated in three symposiums that MUSC has held about um, cannabis as medicine. Very, very, very good. Um, so the, the generation of doctors that are coming up are being taught about this. And, but, but a large number of physicians, they've never thought about marijuana in a medical context. And so another one of the things that this bill does, and another reason why it's one of the more tightly regulated ones, is that if you want to be a physician that authorizes the use of cannabis as medicine, you got to take a continuing me medical education course on cannabis and understand it. So there's got to be that, that, that educational framework. I mean, they can't just go ahead and, and start passing out authorizations. They got to go through that course. Enlighten me, because I, I touched on that when I read through the bill. How much re-education do they have to have? Does it, does it specify? I have, yeah, I have. I know uh, it mentioned it. It does. Um, I want to say it's, it's, it's annually, it's three hours annually of continuing med medical education. I think it's three hours. And that is for the pharmacist and a recommending physician or what yeah this this is in regard to the recommending physician but also in the bill it requires dispensers to have pharmacists nurse practitioners or physicians assistants employed there they also have to take also those, have to do. those courses as well and um and, and again that was a suggestion and a recommendation by the south Carolina medical association i sat down across the table from them and went through a lot of these things 
and, and put a lot of the, these things in there because they requested. I can't think of one thing that they asked me to put in this bill that I didn't put in there. Um, and, well, I will and, give you that, Senator, you have. Yeah, anyway. You have been very open in that area. And um, I was going to make another point. Is there another? I'm sorry, so, go ahead, sir. I continue to yield. No, that's fine. Okay. Uh, I think you've answered many of my questions. I've got the senator from Charleston, Senator Kimson, very patiently. What yes, purpose sir. do you rise? Uh, the senator yields for a question. Sure. sir. Wait, senator, senator yields for a question. Sir, I don't know whether you know. Am I on TV? You know, it'd be a shame if you weren't. Did you know, if, if not, I wanted to come downstairs to the, uh, not to miss this opportunity. I suspect you're going to have an opportunity to come down here. <laughs> just, just, just making a little light heart. Senator, this has been a very engaging discussion uh, today, and we appreciate your passion. How long have you been working on this legislation, Senator? Um, I started in 2014 when we authorized uh, cannabis use for um, epilepsy patients. Um, and so immediately after that, because I, I think what happened is we had a study committee that was appointed the following year, and I was on that study committee, and we went around the state holding hearings. And I remember we went to one in Florence, and um, uh, Senator Leatherman was there, and he sat down and, and listened to it, and he walked up to me afterwards and said, you know, you're absolutely right. I want to be a co-sponsor of your bill. So he's a co-sponsor of my bill, so, you know, I appreciate you. Um, but um, so to answer your question, seven years since yeah, uh, and, since and just to follow up, those who are listening on the live stream may think this is just your bill. Oh no! Uh, you mentioned co-sponsors. How many co-sponsors do you have to this bill? Yeah, I will. Uh, as of today, appreciate you you, you making don't. you making that point because it isn't it isn't my, just my bill. It's it's um, sponsors are me. Uh, Senator Hutto, Senator Malloy, Senator Rankin, Senator Goldfinch, Senator Harputlian, Senator Fanning, Senator Matthews, Senator Kimson, Senator Jackson, the deceased Senator Leatherman, Senator Grooms, Senator Adams, Senator Stevens, Senator Shealy, Senator McLeod. Um, a bipartisan roster of, of senators have put their name on this bill and said, yes, it's time to empower doctors. Yes, it's time to give these patients who are going out and buying things illegally, letting them buy it legally and letting it be safe. Um, and, I'm, I'm, and I know, as you are, very appreciative of all that support. And so that, that almost, that kind of co-sponsorship, if you will, almost mirrors the popularity, uh, at least with respect to the geographical distribution of the state, as your poll. Is that true? It, it, it does, um, you know, it, 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 it polls better in the low country than it does in the upstate. It still polls well in the upstate, but I'm not naive enough to say to you that there are more social conservatives in the upstate than there are on the coast. I think that's just empirically a demographic fact. Um, and that shows up in the cross tabs on these polls, but, but even in the upstate, and even among, you know, Republicans in the upstate, a majority are for this bill. I mean, so, so that's what I was trying to demonstrate when I, when I showed that poll, is, is I want us to know and realize where South Carolinians are on this issue. And, and this is a, a, a point where the people are far ahead of the politicians. And you go home, I go home and talk about this to my constituents, they say, well, what's the problem? If, if, if a doctor thinks that that's in that patient's best interest, why are you telling them no? Well, why are you de denying them access to something that study after study after study shows can be medically efficacious? And I don't have an answer for them. And um, again, I'm just thankful that we're having this debate on this floor. I need, we, we all need to be collective on this and engage on this to figure out a way to make it happen. And if it, if it takes, making the pharmacists more involved in the system, I'll fig we'll figure out a way to make that happen. If it, if it takes, um, you know, working from the center from Charleston Center, Center, if she's worried about, you know, people faking pain and saying and not having, I think we did a pretty good job of trying to tie it to an objectively observed underlying condition, but I'm open to tightening that up again. I don't want a bill that's a sham. I, I, want, I want a bill 
that is truly a medical bill that, that people will look at and say, you know what, unlike California or, or, or Colorado or any of those states, if you're a state that really wants medical and doesn't want recreational and wants to be clear about it, I want this to be that bill. And Senator, back to the poll. Um, I noticed sitting up here that the, the poll increased with public support when you frame the issue in terms of veterans. Can you, can you speak to what type of testimony? I saw a number of veterans out there in the yeah. lobby today. Yeah. Uh, is there a, an example? Uh, you, you cited some examples. We saw your constituent there, and that was a passionate story. Um, but what kind of testimony did you get from veterans? There are a lot of veterans in our respective districts. I, I, absolutely. Um, and, can you um, talk a little bit about that? And, they, and, and as I said, we've, we've had subcommittee hearings on, on iterations of this bill over seven years. And, um, and, and usually we break them down um, into we want law enforcement to be heard, maybe at one of the subcommittee hearings. We want the medical association and doctors to be heard. And we want patients to be heard. And so there have been multiple opportunities for, for patients to come and tell their stories. And the story that's, that's um, illustrative of what most veterans talk about is that they're given dozens of, of prescription medicines that r don't address the underlying trauma and absolutely robs them of their quality of life to the point where you have horrific numbers of suicides. And, and, and just, you know, um, it's hard to watch. Okay, somebody just begging, begging, begging for permission to do something that their doctor thinks is in their best interest, but they can't have it because we say they can't. I don't have a good answer for that. And, and, and to your point about the polls, I was very clear about the pushes. I wanted to say, okay, the Palmetto Family Council opposes this. SLED opposes this. There are some say it can lead to recreational use. Okay, I asked those, those tough, you know, negative push questions you didn't see the numbers move hardly at all. But when you talked about those three positive pushes, that it can help those with PTSD, that it can help you know, individuals who have cancer or MS, or that it can help um, whatever, whatever the third one was, the numbers jump. The numbers jump. And what that tells me is, is that as people are educated about this, as they learn about this, as they start thinking about it in terms of medicine, and not just the way they've historically thought about marijuana, but when they actually come to realize it, well, wait a minute. There's medical evidence out there that can help veterans. There, there's medical evidence out there that it can reduce reliance upon opioids. The numbers go off the charts because it's obvious. So education is a key here. And, and, and part of the seven years has been about educating, not just members of this body, but educating the citizenry. I mean, I've gone around the state. I've spoken to groups. I mean, I've tried to get the word out there. I don't have an entire state agency you know, to, to, to send out to do it, but I do the best that I can. And, and when people understand what I'm talking about and what the evidence is, they're on board. I mean, most of the things that they're saying, well, all the things they just said in the last email are just wrong and demonstrably wrong. Yeah, and Senator, I, I heard about the email this morning, and I, I, I uh, feel your pain on that because I have been the subject, uh, particularly in other contentious debates of disparaging emails. You get these kind of things. I mean, I get an email every day from Donald Trump saying, Tom, I'm writing only you, and, and I want you to give me money, and you can come down to Mar-a-Lago, but you've got to give me money in the next 12 hours. Do you, and then there's a big red button saying, you know, or I can, do you I, get those from? I, I don't get that either. No, no, not that one, but do you get them from, <laughs> do you get them from uh, President Biden or, or from the Democratic Senatorial Caucus? I mean, do you get the same kind of emails too? Senate, Senate will come to order. But, but, Senator, my point is I don't know of a senator, quite frankly, who's met with more groups. You've met with SLED, correct? Multiple times. And SLED gave you feedback. We see where you'd increase their budget by hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more. And did you do the best you could to incorporate SLED and Chief Keel's idea, ideas into the... I a abs absolutely, and not only do I do, do my best, I did it. I mean, their number one ask was, take out burning. We don't want people smoking joints. We don't want that. 
I saw you know, that. A lot of people are angry about that because they say it's the most efficacious way to get the medicine in their bodies. But I've said, look, politics is the art of the possible, okay? I'm trying to advance a bill, and I'm not going to be able to do that if I don't listen to what the number one concern of SLED is. And so I bit the bullet and said, okay, we're going to do that. We're going to take away the ability to burn leaf. I mean, Mississippi's about to pass a law. I guess gave you the numbers that, that allows burning of leaf and bud and all that. I mean, but that's not what I promised this body I was going to do. And, and, Senator, did you know there are a number of proponents of the bill, but there are a number of proponents of the bill who are upset that this bill I, is so conservative. In fact, I think you mentioned that this is the most conservative bill of the uh, 37 states that have already It'll be passed. 37 once Mississippi House and Senate are rec reconciling the version of the bill, so it'll be this week probably. But 37 states in the District of Columbia. So you got the most conservative bill. Now, did you meet with the medical community? And did you incorporate their ideas and, and any recommendations they had? In, in, in regard to the supervisory powers of the Board of Medical Examiners, in regard to the education requirement, in regard to the things that they would have to go through in order to certify use of cannabis, how they go about you know, providing that written authorization. Um, I, mean, I mean, those are a few of the examples. And, and then, of course, I build them right in, working with their attorney, building it in there. Same with DHEC. I mean, DHEC, I mean, sat down. I mean, they gave me a, a holistic markup of the bill, and I incorporated all those changes. I mean, this is a thoroughly vetted bill with input from all stakeholders, um, and, and it's a bill, I submit to you, we can be proud of. And, Senator, even beyond that, you've stated on the Senate floor a number of times that you are, you are in favor of friendly amendments or amendments to be debated to this bill. Is that correct? There, there's... Um, um, my friend, Senator from Spartanburg, has got some concerns about some portions of the bill, and he's working on some language. Um, Senator Loftus brought to my attention some concerns regarding the dispensing aspect of that. I want to look into how we can integrate pharmacists into the process. Um, I, I'm open. Look, this is our bill. Okay, and this Senator, is the Senate's bill. And you may not know this, Senator, but I had a meeting with staff this morning. I have, uh, I'm working on an amendment to sort of piggyback on uh, what Senator uh, Loftus uh, commented on early that the local participation. Did you know that when we look at hemp, uh, a concern that has been addressed or at least communicated to me is that the big out-of-state firms that have scale, what I mean by that, you, that, that incorporate more than just one specific area of business, distribution, processing, growing, Dispensing, they're able to, to, to achieve con economies of scales due to the huge magnitude of the operation. And so we're going to be working together uh, because I think the people of South Carolina, uh, if this bill is successful, and I hope it is, uh, the people of South Carolina deserve to participate uh, in, in this uh, venture effort. And uh, uh, did you know that? Yeah, and, and, and again, you're, you're touching upon another aspect of the bill that could be improved. I mean, right now, it's simply a waiting factor to be considered positively by DHEC. And maybe we want to be a, a little bit more aggressive in that regard to make sure it's South Carolinians. And, and we haven't even talked about, I've been talking about medicine, sure. helping patients, but we're also talking about economic activity. You're talking about jobs. You're talking about capital investment. I mean, so, I, I, but I, I never lead with that. I'm, I mean, people always say, Talk to them about how much money this is going to result to the state coffers. And, and, and I'm reluctant to do that because I don't think that's, what, that's not what this is about. Um, and in fact, the way I've set things up is, 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 is told DHEC to only charge those administrative fees for licenses that are necessary to cover the costs of monitoring the program. Because I don't see it as a revenue raiser. But it's going to be. Well, understood I mean, that, Senator. Your, your concern, that's why it's called the Compassionate Care Act, your compassion for people who have been stricken with conditions and alleviating the pain of those conditions. Is that right? And, and that's, that's always been my emphasis on this. It's not been as a revenue generator. I'm making the point, though, that, that it is going to have an economic consequence that's positive for South Carolina. I'm, I'm making that point in passing. And my final question, Senator, I know you've been going a long time and you, you, are, more, you are able to carry us into the wee hours of the morning. I hope I don't 
go into the wee hours in the morning. There's a reception, did you know, at Ruth Chris that I'd like to go get a steak or something. Uh, but with respect to the medical criteria, uh, the medical criteria is not all encompassing. In other words, you've listed a number of debilitating conditions, but you excluded some too, is that right? I did, and I, I pared that list down. Um, I, I started with a list of like 24, 25 conditions, um, but I made, well, we all made the decision, or I, I don't know who made the decision, but this is what happened. We pared it down to only those conditions for which I could find peer-reviewed medical studies showing that cannabis can be of, of medical benefit. And, and I did that because, well, because it allows me to make a more compelling argument for this bill, right? I mean, if we're talking about a whole laundry list of things for which there's no medical evidence that cannabis could be a benefit, you can make the argument that the bill is a sham. You're, you're talking about this being a medical cannabis bill, but you're authorizing it to be used for conditions that aren't benefited by cannabis. Right. So, so in keeping with the promise I made to y'all, I mean, the promise that we all kind of made to each other, that this is going to be a medical bill, that's why I limited it down to that, that there's 13. I mean, as I say, Mississippi's passing one with two dozen um, conditions on there. And it may be over time, Senator from Charleston, as more medical research is, is available and we know more about how cannabis interacts with people with other conditions, we may decide we, we, we broaden it, okay? But, but that's got to be based on science. And I didn't want to take us in a direction if I couldn't stand here in this well and honestly tell you that there's medical evidence that it can be beneficial for these conditions. Very narrow list again, Senator, and I noted that you have a committee set up uh, as this bill unwinds and progresses, if passed, to re-examine the criteria. And there may be some debilitating conditions you take out uh, as a result of the evolution of some new drug, but we had a process in place since we got a really narrowly tailored list. You put in a process in place uh, whereby this body, some of the governmental officials, including the governor, can appoint people to examine the medical criteria on a continuing basis. Isn't that true, sir? It, it is, and, and one, of the, one of the frustrating things has been be, because marijuana is still a Schedule I drug under the Controlled Substances Act, there haven't been the number of clinical trials and studies that have been done as otherwise there might have been. And so while there is a lot of studies that have been done, peer-reviewed studies, which, which I'm, I'm kind of giving you the results from that, um, it has been chilled by the fact that it's still a Schedule I under the CSA. You haven't had the degree of clinical trials. So as it becomes more tested and we learn more about it and more studies are done, we're going to find out well, maybe it may contract in some regards and say, well, really, it doesn't help here. But we may see the other happen, like, well, these conditions can help. So it's going to be driven by wherever the, the science and the data takes us. We, we hear that all the time now, right? Follow the science, okay? That's what I've tried to do in this bill, is, is I've always tried, we've tried to do in this bill, is put forward conditions for which there is science that's peer-reviewed that says, yes, it can help. Thank you, Senator. Senator from Holland, and what purpose do you rise? To see if the senator would yield. For questions? Yes. For questions. Senator yields. Senator, um, I'm not going to give you another attaboy. I think everybody in this chamber has given you an attaboy for all of the uh, work that you've done on this legislation. Since I've been in the Senate, you've been talking about this issue, um, and you've done admirable work. And, but since I've been in the Senate, what I really want to ask you is, you are, since being over this subcommittee, you're the only subcommittee chair that actually handed out assignments to each of the subcommittee members to deal with each of the issues that you're talking about today. If I rec and it was the first time I'd been, did you realize that I, it was the first time I'd been on a committee where, if, if you recall, um, I believe the senator from Charleston, Senator Kempson, was assigned through our, at our first uh, medical affairs subcommittee on these uh, on this bill. You gave him the financial aspects, and because you knew of my background in both representing law enforcement, defending them. Um, defending them personally and pr previously um, through the state, 
you I, I assigned me um, the law enforcement portion. And, and, and you came up with work product that we then incorporated into the bill because I, I recognize I'm a real estate lawyer, okay? I, right. I, I don't try DUI cases. I don't interact a lot with the police. And so you have that real world experience that was brought to bear on this bill in an area where I didn't have the experience. And, right. and, and, I, and, and, I, and it's my hope that this whole body now in looking at this can bring their experiences and make the bill even better. Right. And, and in that regard, did you um, receive a report from me I As did. it relates to law enforcement, and I think it goes to some of what Senator Loftus was asking earlier about issues and DUI stops, as well as some of the generalized issues that we've tried to weed out of this bill as it relates to what we looked at were concerns when you weighed the compassionate care of an individual versus protecting the society and protecting law enforcement concerns. Yeah, I think, I think one of the things, because of that process you're talking about, Senator, about this bill, when compared to the bills in the 36 other states, about to be 37 states that have legalized it, is it looks at some of those other aspects more thoroughly. For instance, um, workplace. Um, the Chamber of Commerce, you know, had concerns. They wanted to make sure that private employers still had the ability to have a drug-free workplace if they wanted to, that this wasn't going to be some sort of a requirement that they allowed their employees, um, you know, to, to, to vape um, on the premises. Or, I mean, so we added language in there to, to give the business community the comfort they wanted there. They wanted to control their workspace. And, and, and again, I'm happy to do it. And, and if you recall, Senator, one of the chief things that Chief Keel was concerned about in the times when I came up to Columbia and met just individually in a conference room with all of the law enforcement players on this issue, one of their primary concerns is if one of their officers ever wanted to, um, had to use um, this product. Well, and I think Chief Keel, did you know, his biggest, biggest concern that if they are um, prescribed this drug, then they can't carry a gun. Did we do what we could as it relates to protecting his concern regarding that issue? We, we addressed all those concerns. I mean, the concerns, you, you identified concerns, and then you provided language that addressed those concerns that were then incorporated into the bill. Right. And I didn't bring my binder here, but I took notes and I made sure right. that I brought those back to the subcommittee because we met. I be, it was several times that our committee met, but I brought those back. But at the end of the day, after we look, because, of course, we all want law enforcement to be protected while they're out there doing um, their jobs and protecting us. At, at, and that's, well, the, the staff's not up there anymore, but I think this entire body yes. supports law enforcement, would never consider defunding law enforcement, which is why I was so confused when I got that email saying, we're falling in line with those who want to defund the police. Which, well, and, which I, and, I, I, and I hope that that's just the fringes, because we all in this line of business know we have to deal with the fringes. Because I remember, I mean, after the first medical affairs subcommittee that I was on, I got calls from folks. And I got calls from those officers that know me well, that work with me in and out, um, in not, not one, I think three different agencies called. One of the primary things, and I know you've heard it, I've heard some of the senators say it today, this is a gateway drug. Well, how, I, I keep, every time I hear that, I've asked, what is your data? How does it become a gateway drug when we, and did you know, that we in the United States permit opioids. But did you know, when my daughter had excruciating pain after gallbladder, in Germany, that country will not permit the use or the prescribing of any op opioids because of what it does to the receptors in the brain. But the yet we allow that, and that's what really is considered one of the biggest gateway drugs. Did you know that? I, I did, and, and, and one of the most compelling things, um, um, Senator from um, Colleton, 
is the direct correlation between the availability of cannabis as medicine and the decrease in opioids prescribed, right. the decrease in opioid overdoses. Right. And, and, and again, intuitively that makes sense, right? Because if, if you're going to prescribe something else like cannabis for, for chronic pain or for conditions that opioids are traditionally provided for, and, and, if, if, um, and if it works, which it does, you're going to see a drop in those opioid prescriptions. You're going to see a drop in those fatalities. And, and again, this isn't a talking point that I can't back up. I've got study after study after study that shows in those states, they, they, can, they can compare it and show you. I, I gave statistics earlier about the decrease in the prescribing and the, and the, and the opioid, opioid deaths. And so, um, I mean, to me, those who argue against medical cannabis to me, they don't factor in one of the obvious consequences of that, which is you're going to then turn to opioids, which are much more dangerous. I mean, they, they, don't, they, don't, they don't analyze that opportunity cost, okay, or that, 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 that consequence. But by not doing this, we're keeping that same situation in place that is just deplorable right now. That's right. And, and, um, and Senator, did you, have you followed the communication with law enforcement when they make that argument that's, that this is a gateway drug. Have, I've questioned them over and over. Well, have you sat in court and seen the effects of case after case after case of marijuana? And then it's sad when you sit up there and you see someone say, and you see businessmen, businesswomen, people with jobs that are having to try to find a way to not use opi opioids and end up getting marijuana. My, myself, the saddest case I saw was a gentleman in his 80s come into court to plead to marijuana possession because he was getting it for his sick wife. That's sad. This is where we are in America. It's, 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 what the, it's what they're doing, Senator from Colleton, out of desperation because the prescription drugs aren't working That's and right. they're suffering and they know something that will work and, and especially if you have a loved one. I, I, I honestly, I don't think anybody in this chamber, if they had a daughter or a son that had that pain and there was no prescription, again, these are the conditions before a physician can authorize its use. Prescriptions can't, can't help, okay? That's one, of the, that's one of the conditions. That marijuana would relieve that suffering, that they would, they would deny that to their child. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. So, so what we're doing, in a sense, is we're acknowledging, and I think I had a conversation with, I think Senator Johnson even said, I think, well, maybe I might do it. Um, but he would still feel bad about it because it was illegal. Well, I want to make it not illegal anymore. But, but, but if you're... If you're knowingly saying, yeah, I'd break the law because I think it's the right thing to do, why is that the law? Exactly. But, but this bill makes it so it's, it, you're, if you are prescribed, you have to have identification on you at all times. It's in a central system. Who, the average person who are doing this for, um, any, for a fake reason, that, that's what a lot of law enforcement challenge us, that these people are going to fake these physical. The average person who um, really have a prescription from a doctor, have this card, are registered and have the right to uh, this particular drug, if you are doing it for nefarious reasons, you wouldn't want to be into the database of South Carolina. Well, here, here's, here, and you just reminded me of something, Senator from Colleton. Um, I think as a matter of economics, it doesn't make any sense that somebody's going to lie to their doctor, try to fake their doctor out, um, and, 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 and subject themselves to a felony. That's right. For, as opposed to a misdemeanor. I mean, if you want to smoke something recreationally and, and, and for adult use, you're not going to get a medical card and subject yourself to a felony conviction for diverting it for recreational use. Moreover, you're not going to do it because it's going to be much more expensive for medical because it's gone through this entire process. You've had independent lab testing. It's been labeled. You got quality control. It's going to be much more expensive. So this idea that I, I don't get how legalizing medical under these, under these limited conditions is going to lead to a spike in recreational use. It doesn't make any sense economically. 
It, it doesn't make any sense from in terms of penalties if, if, you, if you're caught. Right. You go to jail, it's a felony after five years in prison. We put that, put that in there too. Again, to my point about underscoring, we're serious about this. This is medicine, and there are substantial consequences that will occur to you if you do not treat it like medicine. Right. And Senator, wouldn't you agree, and this is my last question slash point, wouldn't you agree that this isn't a power play between taking care of our most sick and vulnerable South Carolinians versus whether or not we support the police? Wouldn't you no. agree? And, that, and that's, of all the things that was in that email, that's the most offensive. That's right. That, that, that by somehow, not only am well, I, I'm, I'm apparently not a leader of industrial marijuana complex, okay, so that's another thing, but to somehow say, no, you're also not a party boy either. But, that other so somehow say that, that since I'm for this bill mm -hmm. and because I want to empower doctors to help patients under very limited circumstances, that I'm in the same cloth of, of those out there who wanted to fund the police. I mean, that's why I went and, and pulled that statistic up. We respect our law enforcement here in South Carolina, as we should. And we show that in the, way, the best way possible, which is appropriating funds and giving them the support they need. Um, and and I, I, I know Senator Martin, who has that subcommittee, he has never begrudged a law enforcement request that, that was meritorious. Never. Because right. that's not who we are in South Carolina. Again, so, we're so South Carolina. We're not another state. We're South Carolina. And to throw that in there, it, it spoke to me like a buzzword. They want to throw a buzzword in there so people will be afraid that if you vote for this bill, somebody's going to attack you and say you're for defunding the police. So the but, challenge is protecting those and giving compassionate care, giving the authority to the patient and their doctor versus making sure that we acknowledge law enforcement. I, I, but absolutely, coming, absolutely. Asking them to come to the table and just don't give a blanket statement, oh, it's a gateway drug. Give us ways to protect and make this bill better. And, and I'm open to that. I mean, I want, again, this is our bill, okay? This is all of our bill. And this is something I want us all to have input on. I've already got my assignment to write down about maybe do something about pharmacists, maybe do something about some other things, but there are ways to make this bill better. I, I, I don't pretend otherwise. Thank you very much. Senate stand at ease momentarily. Senator from Buford. Do we have a color copier in here? What color? I want to. Um, it might be helpful for in, in the chamber. Um, just, I think it'd be helpful for the members to and, and ask unanimous consent to distribute materials. Without objection, unanim, unanim, unanimous just so, consent. To, just so to, you can uh, see the locality of the 36 states that have legalized medical cannabis. And I think you're gonna be surprised at some of these states. Um, so. Thank you. Senator from Edgefield, what purpose do you rise? Mr. President, with the Senator from Beaufort retaining the floor, I'd ask unanimous consent that we carry over this bill. Unanimous consent request, any objection? Hearing none, so ordered. Mr. Senator President. from Edgefield. Mr. President, I'd ask unanimous consent that we go to the joint resolution related to the judicial elections for next week? I think it's H40, no. H4746 on page, page 18. 18. By, is there objection? Sorry. Yeah, we already by previous order go to that. Uh, Senator from Spartanburg, P Senator uh, Martin, what purpose do you ask? Um, to ask if we're now on House Bill 4746. We are on that. Resolution. Yes, sir. I'd like to be heard. Senator from Spartanburg, Senator Martin is recognized. 
Thank you, Mr. President, members of the Senate. I want to thank the body and those that worked with us on this issue to make sure that our votes are accounted correctly. And with that and the, the procedures of the Joint Assembly and what we're able to do with here in the Senate, I would like to ask unanimous consent to withdraw Amendment 1A. Unanimous consent. Any objection with the Senator withdrawing Amendment 1A? Hearing none, so ordered. Mr. President. Senator from Spartanburg. Are there any further amendments? There are no further amendments. Thank you. Thank you. The pending question would be the adoption of H4746. All in favor would say aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. So ordered. The resolution is adopted. Senator from Edgefield, what purpose do you ask? Mr. President, um, I move that the Senate go into executive session. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. The Senate will be in executive session. Sergeant, please clear the chamber.
Senate, come to order. Senator from Edgefield, what purpose do you rise? Mr. President, let me do a quick check and see if anybody has any unanimous consent requests. You got some? Senator Morey, what purpose do you rise? Uh, unanimous consent request to save some St ink on some paper. Uh, 966, which was a Senate reapportionment bill. I moved to recommit that since the House has passed uh, and concurred with uh, the changes we made to their bill. Page one, moved to recommit 966. Page one, S966, moved to recommit to the Judiciary Committee. I'll, is there objection? Hearing none. So ordered. Mr. President. Yes, sir. Senator Medgefield. I move the Senate do now adjourn. Motion is that the Senate do now adjourn. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The Senate is adjourned till 11 a.m. tomorrow morning. Have a good evening. <laughs>